Good morning. Please maintain silence until the meeting begins. It is. It's the um, it's the, it's the thing that crashed into me. Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, September 27, 2022. This proceeding is being broadcast on Channel 35. The exact broadcast times can be found by contacting Channel 35. Board of Water and Power Commissioners, please stay present for roll call. Commissioner Lehrer? Present. President McLean Hill? Present. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Present. Vice President Ruiz. Present. Four board members present, a quorum. Madam President. Uh, thank you. And um, I actually do have opening remarks this morning. I'd like to begin by, um, by acknowledging His uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. So good morning. Before we begin, um, let's see. September 15th is important because it marks Independence Day for Latin American countries, including Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Nicaragua. September 16th also marks Independence Day for Mexico and Chile. Accordingly, we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month nationally from September 15th through October 15th. Other than the relevance of this month to these countries, Hispanic Heritage Month is also an important time to recognize and celebrate the diverse histories, cultures, and extensive contributions that Hispanics have made, have provided to our nation and to our department. This year's theme is Unidos, inclusivity for a stronger nation. And I would like to also expand on that theme of inclusive, inclusivity for stronger LADWP. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are over 62 million Hispanics in the United States today who continue to contribute to the advancement of our country and to the communities that they serve in industries like manufacturing, as small business owners, teachers, and many other professions. Hispanic Heritage Month allows us to recognize their important achievements in the workforce, in education, culture, art, and even in the utility industry. In fact, many of the things that make Los Angeles and LADWP, the city, and the municipal utility that we have today are due in part to the legacy of Hispanic leadership here in Los Angeles. Jose Cristobal Aguilera, was a three-term Los Angeles mayor serving between 1866 
in 1867. He was a strong proponent of keeping LA's water system under municipal ownership rather than selling it off to be run by private interest. Without his foresight, LA would have lost control of its publicly owned water system, which today operates for the benefit of all LADWP customers. This was also exemplified by Commissioner um, Devalle, who was the longest serving LADWP commissioner in history, mm -hmm. serving from 1908 to 1929. He was instrumental in many of the decisions that paved the way for the construction of the Los Angeles Aqueduct. One of the most important things he did was employ diplomacy and influence to maintain peace with stakeholders in the Owens Valley. Today, up to 37% of the LADW workforce is comprised of Hispanics and they helped to further this department in many of our operations. They represent 42% of skilled craft employees and 53% of service and maintenance, working hard every day to build a stronger LA. And there are many Latino leaders who keep LADWP running and innovating to becoming stronger LA. So it is with great pride that we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month as a diverse workforce working together toward a common purpose and goal of providing our customers with reliable water and power service. As we say, Sumus LADWP, or we are LADWP. Thank you, and I look forward to the various celebratory events this month, many led by our Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, or SHIP. And um, before moving on, I have one additional piece that I'd like to take <clears throat> care of this morning. I will be moving the item M6 to the front. And this is a very special presentation to a departing, I guess I have to say city attorney or <laughs> employee, <laughs> but really a treasured member of the LADWP team, um, David Edwards. Uh, for those of you who don't know, let me read his resolution. Whereas Mr. David J. Edwards served as deputy city attorney for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power since 2011 and devoted 17 years of public service with the city of LA, particularly in the areas of water and natural resources. And whereas Mr. Edwards fiercely defended the city's water rights throughout the Los Angeles aqueduct system and served as the lead attorney for the Inyo LA long-term water agreement. And whereas Mr. Edwards efforts to protect the local environment while ensuring a reliable supply for the city of Los Angeles has resulted in litigation victories and historic settlement agreements relating to LADWP's operations in the Eastern Sierra. And whereas Mr. Edwards demonstrated LADWP's commitment to the Owens Lake Dust Mitigation Program, the largest dust mitigation program in the United States, and worked with staff to collect evidence showing dust is 99.4% contained and that the project should move to new to a new maintenance phase that would conserve water and increase LADWP's ability to implement new, more efficient dust control measures. And whereas Mr. Edwards' expertise in environmental and permit issues help protect threatened or endangered species through the development of agreements with entities such as the United States Fish and Wildlife Service for the Golden Eagle California con Condor, <coughs> and by state sage grouse, while also preserving LADWP's water and power operations and supporting clean energy goals. And whereas Mr. Edwards worked with the Board of Water and Power Commissioners to develop LADWP's tribal liaison and tribal 
engagement policy programs and cultural resource protection protocols and guided LADWP's interactions with various sovereign tribal nations in the Owens Valley, as well as Navajo Nation and the Walk River Tribe, I'm sorry, Walker River Tribe, working to garner an understanding of each tribal nation's unique history. And whereas Mr. Edwards drafted amendments to the City of Los Angeles Comprehensive Water Conservation Ordinance, which predated and served as the model for California's own conservation mandates to address responses to emerging and ongoing drought conditions and continues to make impact in managing the current historic drought. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Water and Power Commissioners on behalf of the management of this department, its employees and the residents of the city of Los Angeles, thank Mr. Edwards for his dedicated public service and wish him continued success. Be it further resolved that the secretary be instructed to place this resolution in the minutes of this board as a permanent record and that an engrossed copy of this resolution be presented to Mr. Edwards in recognition of his commit committed dedication to public service in this city. I hereby certify that the foregoing is a full, true, and correct copy of a resolution that will be adopted by the Board of Water and Power Commissioners of the City of LA at its meeting held on September 27, uh, 2022. And before yielding for other comments, I simply want to say that it is rare that you meet um, a, a public servant, and in particular, a lawyer who is <laughs> as committed uh, to his client's interest as David um, has been throughout his tenure here. It is a, a crippling <clears throat> loss, uh, one that I am um, loathe to accept, uh, but wishing San Diego the very best. Uh, in addition to his fierceness in defending the department, I also want to make note of David's um, generosity in um, terms of respecting and um, promoting the interest of the environment and of others who um, have been often involved in this ever tangled process of preserving LADWP's water rights. And it is with enormous um, uh, sadness, but also with uh, great affection and admiration that I want to say congratulations on your new position and wish you the very, very best. Um, I will open the floor for any other comments or presentations. May, may I also? Please. Chairman? Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, that was a very well said, Cynthia. I couldn't agree more with everything you said. Uh, you took many of the words uh, that I wanted to say out of my mouth because with the, the, the litany of successes and uh, victories and historic agreements don't convey is really the commitment and the passion and the c complete determination to defend um, LA. And we saw, I saw it every time you came to every meeting and um, you will absolutely be missed. Um, and this is a, definitely a blow for us, but we, of course, wish you the greatest success. Um, and when it's not as much fun, uh, you are welcome back. <laughs> uh, anything else from the dais uh, or from the commissioners before moving to staff? So I would just like to say thank you and acknowledge you, especially for your work around the tribal engagement policy. I think that's such an important piece. And I know it took a lot of work and I just wanted to say Thank you, because as I move forward in my position, that is going to be the foundation for the work that I do uh, with the different tribes. So thank you for that. And best of luck in, in your next venture. Uh, I, I, I want to voice the appreciation for the work you did at Owens and uh, the dust mitigation project. It has been a very, very important uh, sort of project across the nation, people understanding uh, what, what, what the work has been as we dewater 
areas like that. But um, thank you for the work you've done for sort of all these environmental uh, issues that we address in our region. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins. <coughs> Over there, if you don't mind. What are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning, Commissioners, and Selma Collins, Senior AGM for the Water System. And I couldn't let this opportunity pass without saying a couple of words about Dave. Personally, I've been working with Dave for, gosh, the last like six years or so when I first took over Water Operations Division. And uh, I got to tell you, there's not too many more people as dedicated as he is in this place. Uh, although he's an attorney, um, he's <laughs> <laughs> not trying to brag an attorney. Yes. But, uh, yes. He, yeah. <laughs> That's some standing over here, Commissioner. Um, but for somebody who's not an engineer, he understands the technical issues that we have to deal with on a regular basis. Understand this probably better than some of the engineers working on it sometimes. His dedication to protecting the water system and the Department of Water and Power in the city in general is, is admirable. I can tell you that I spent, gosh, many hours traveling between here and Owens Valley with Dave, speaking to every single tribe up in the Owens Valley, went over to Arizona to recruit people to help us out with the efforts. He was instrumental in drafting the travel engagement policy. He protected the work that we did at Owens Lake, our challenges with the Air District, not just in Owens, but in Mono as well, and also all the work that we do under the, under the water agreement. And um, not only is he a really good attorney, but he's also a great person too. And I think that's very important to all of us. You know, he is a friend. I, I hate to see him go, but I know he's going to a really good organization. I, I know the general manager over there, and I know she's very happy to have him come over. <laughs> so um, our loss is their gain. So I wanted to just give a couple of things to Dave here. The first thing is, since you're going to be working now in San Diego County, uh, I didn't want you to forget where you came from. And since you told me you needed a little water and power hat, so you get your own PC hat. Hopefully it fits your head now since you are probably still enough from all the good things we're saying about it. All right. And then the last thing I wanted to do, this is a little something that was prepared by the Water Operations Division, the aqueduct section, where he spent most of his time doing work with them. And what this is, it's a plaque that has some salt crystals. For those of you who've been to Owens Lake, you do know that there is a fair amount of salt crystals that form <laughs> on the lake itself. It comes from the local mountains, it dissolves, it runs down with the water from the rain, it deposits there, and then you get a thick layer of crystals that form. So this was put together by the staff there, and the plaque says, David Edwards, you have been worth your salt. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with your personality, of course. I'm not saying you have a salty personality. I'm salty. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you from the Water Operations Aqueduct Section, September 2022. There you go, sir. Well, I, you know, I, it's hard to know where to start. I, you know, I'm a, I came to LA to work here. Uh, I have the distinct honor to have been given incredible opportunities by Julie Riley, who whose leadership is unmatched, as you all know. By Marty Adams, my first, <clears throat> my first assignment was staff and Marty on a trip to Bridgeport for Great Basin meeting, 2011. And the thing that makes this job great and easy and exciting and challenging and all of that is the staff that's here. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I come to work and I just absorb the work that is being done by all of you. And the talent, the knowledge, the work uh, ethic is unbelievable to me. And I'm amazed by it every single day. I'm humbled. It's been 
the joy of my professional life to this point to have served the city and the department. Uh, AC, I appreciate this. All of you at the aqueduct, you know, I, I could start going through names and then I'd forget somebody and I'd feel terrible, but you all know who you are. Um, I love this place. I'm gonna miss it. Thank you, President Clayne Hill, uh, for all the kind words and, and all of you on the board. I truly appreciate it. I'm exceptionally proud of the work we did on the tribal engagement policy, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say you need to get a meeting with Manly Begay and, and, and hear what he has to say because the salt's interesting because Manly asked me one time to get him some of that because he carries around a little leather pouch and the salt has a certain medicine for, for the Navajo people and uh, so that's sort of a sim, sim, symbiotic thing there. Anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle, my partner, for coming. Um, you know, I love you all and I'll see you around. <laughs> thank Appreciate you. It. Uh, thank you, and um, with that, we will move to general public comment. Uh, how many speakers do we have? I believe we have 22, Madam President. Okay. Wow. Good morning, speakers. Please be mindful that you will have two minutes for public comment. The first speaker is Dominique Esteban, who will be followed by Laura... Garana. Good morning. Um, my name is Dominique Eastman. I'm the Regional Property Operations Manager at uh, AIDS Health Care Foundation. Um, at AHF, we provide 100% affordable housing to about 1,179 units that we have acquired at our own cost with no assistance for any outside source. Um, our average rent is $550 a month. Um, the median unit size is around 200 square foot, a little less than 200 square foot um, a unit. Um, we do not charge tenants for any um, CAM costs or utilities costs. Uh, in any event, the buildings are, they're old, um, and some of them are historical. Um, we're unable to meter each individual unit, and we really don't want to. Um, because of our tenant demographic. Um, so AHF is seeking um, aggressive utility um, rate from LADWP so we can continue to provide uh, affordable housing to residents that may not qualify for the project-based or sub subsidy-based housing. Thank you. next speaker is Laura Garana, who will be followed by Ann Kim. I'm sorry, Laura Garcia, please excuse me. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Laura Gracia. I'm with Communities for a Better Environment. Uh, we're an environmental justice organization to build people power and low-income communities of color. We are happy partners of the Repower LA Coalition. A lot of our members are here today and in the overflow room. Um, so uh, what I do at CBE is work with communities across the state around climate resilience and adaptation. And why is that so important for us to talk about here? Um, a lot of our members are going to be speaking about how uh, power shutoffs water shutoffs really impact their daily lives. And while all of that is so true and that is what like needs to lead this decision, ultimately power shutoffs are, uh, are, do inhibit people's ability to be resilient during an extreme heat event, during, uh, um, uh, especially if you're living in an environmental justice community near oil drilling or a refinery, there's their actual flaring events that if someone has an air purifier and the, sh and the power is off, they're not able to use that air purifier. If there's someone living with a disability and they don't have access to uh, backup power storage, um, all of that to say is it is really essential to listen to what folks are saying today. It's really essential for LADWP to stop 
water and power shutoffs. It is the real climate solution that we need to make sure that frontline communities and low income com communities are have the ability to, to adapt during a climate event. Um, in 2020, uh, we started an emergency fund and this was the least that we could do during a time of loss, during a time of like confusion, it was just way overwhelming. Um, and so many folks just came to us and they were scared, right? Like rent was an issue, food was an issue, people lost people, people lost relationships, right? People lost their jobs as well. And so this was the best way that we could put a little Band-Aid over, over, over that and support them. And this is something that ultimately you all can do to really support people on the daily because a lot of people are still living in that situation. Could be two years later, but a lot of people are still facing a lot of the same issues. So anyways, I really hope that you all listen and you stop uh, water and power shutoffs. Thank you. I think I heard a beep. The next speaker is Ann Kim, who will be followed by Maria Montez. Hi, uh, I think I spoke I, I spoke uh, two weeks ago, so I, I, I'm probably familiar. My name is Ann Kim. I'm with AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I'm here with some of my colleagues here. You heard from Dominique just uh, just a little bit ago. I just want to reiterate a couple points that I, I made last time, which is, again, the homeless count in LA County is almost 70,000. In the city, it's over 40,000. We're trying to do our best, you know, do our best to do our part. Um, you know, we're charging, as we said, we're charging $550 um, for rent, which is unheard of in Los Angeles. Our DWP bill for June, for one month, it was $20,000 for 200 units. Do you know what that means? That's, that's about $100 a unit for units that we charge $550 for. That's, that's unsustainable. The dollars that we could put to work to put more affordable housing out there is going to... 20% <laughs> of it is going to DWP. Unheard of for 200 square foot units that we have to pay $100 a month for, close to $100. Um, we want you to work with us. We know you have lifeline programs. We know you do things for disadvantaged folks. So please work with us to put a program together for our clients, our tenants as well, because these are the, these are the very people that you're trying to help and we want to help. We need to work together to do it. And like I said, your off the shelf programs are probably not going, going to work because we don't have individual meters. But you know, but if you need if you need any information about our residents and tenants, they're readily available for anyone who anyone out there who wants who wants to work with us. These are these are the people that are on SSI that are on fixed income that we're trying to help that to stay off the streets. So please work with us. Last, you know, I know we've been here a couple times via phone. We've been here, you know, in person, but we hadn't heard back. We want to hear back from you. We want you want we want you to reach back out to us. We're reaching out to you. Please reach back out to us. Thank you. The next speaker is Maria Montez, who will be followed by Dulce Altamarino. Dulce Altamarino. Buenos días, mi nombre es María Montes y yo soy uh, residente de San Pedro. Estamos cerca de Wilmington también. Uh, yo solamente vengo a pedir uh, que tengamos un poquito más de cuidado. Excuse me, do we have translation? Thank you. Okay, nuevamente. Ah, buenos días, mi nombre es María Montes, soy residente de San Pedro. Good morning, my name is María Montes, and I am a resident from San Pedro. Es del sur donde también está Wilmington, Carson, y otros uh, lugares del sur de Cal Los Ángeles. All those areas in the south of Los Angeles, Wilmington, Carson. Y yo solamente vengo a pedirles, por favor, uh, que si pueden hacer poco más accesibles a, el, la luz un poco más bajos porque la gente de bajos ingresos and I'm just here to ask you if you can bring down the cost of the especially the light the energy lower and make it more affordable especially for people with low income 
Tienen problemas de pagar, sobre todo en ese tiempo de calor. We are having problems to pay, especially in this time that it's so hot. Este, se ocupa más energía y luego también si tenemos muchos aparatos conectados hay apagones. And we really need more energy and we have, if we have many devices connected at the same time, there are shut-offs. Y yo sé que todos estamos tratando de apoyarnos pues porque estamos en problemas con la luz y el agua. And I know that we are all trying to support each other we are, because we are having problems with water and with, with the light. Pero también hay mucha gente que ocupa los servicios como gente que tiene medicamentos que tienen que refrigerarse. Also, there are some problems with, there are many problems with people that need um, medicines that need to be refrigerated. Y personas que ten, dependen de un aparato eléctrico. Or some people that have an illness that may depend on an electric device. Y también, por ejemplo, si en un momento de apagón no está no tan suficiente carga para sus aparatos o se arruina el refrigerador, se, se descompone el refrigerador. So then, when there is a shut up, many times there's not enough energy and then the fridge gets ruined or other devices get ruined and they don't work anymore. Pues sus cosas, sus servicios como medicamentos se echan a perder y pérdida de dinero para ellos. And then all the medicines that are in the fridge it gets spoiled and that's like a waste of money for them. Y uh, también a uh, tener en cuenta que hay gente que gana más accesible las aplicaciones para bajos recursos solo como dijo el compañero. And also to uh, also the other the other person said like um, that the applications para bajo recursos for low income porque nuestros ancianos o personas de tercera edad because our elders es difícil para ellos llenar tanta aplicación it is difficult for them to fill in all the applications que tuvieran un acceso más fácil porque a veces también la tecnología avanza pero ellos se quedan atorados because um, if they can have like a better access to these kind of um, applications because technologies move forwards but they stay behind Y les quiero dar gracias por escuchar. And I want to say thank you to all of you for listening to me. Gracias. The next speaker is Dulce Altamarino, followed by Robin Line. Hola, buen día a todos. Mi nombre es Dulce Altamirano. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dulce Altamirano. Y soy parte de CBI. Nosotros abogamos por una por tierra, agua y electricidad más limpia. And we are asking for earth, for water, and for more clean electricity. Pero en esta ocasión ven, vengo a abogar no nada más por mi familia, sino por la comunidad entera. I came here to advocate not only for my family, but for the whole community. Vengo a decirles cómo impacta nuestra, nuestra salud a nuestra comunidad. Impacta fuertemente I, los apagones. I come to, here to tell you how much these shadows of the electricity is impacting our health and our community. Creo yo, estoy segura, no lo creo, estoy segura que nuestra electricidad no es un lujo, es una necesidad. I, I know, I have certainty that electricity, the energy, is not like a luxury, but it is a necessity. Es esencial para nuestras familias, para nuestros hijos y nuestra comunidad. It is essential for our families, for our children, and for our community. Y cuando algo se muestra hace una necesidad, Entonces es un derecho humano que tenemos. So if it is if it is a necessity, it's a need, then it's a human right that we have. Así que la electricidad es una, un derecho humano y nos impacta nuestra salud y bienestar de nuestra familia y comunidad. Los que tenemos cáncer, los que tenemos eczema, los que tenemos diabetes y les podría decir más cantidad de enfermedades cómo nos afecta. So this is uh, the lack of uh, the shadows of the um, energy electricity this is uh, impacting us our health especially those who suffer from cancer, diabetes or eczema and so many more illnesses that are impacted by this problem. Entramos en pánico cuando están los apagones. 
a we, causa de, de eso nuestra salud, también psicológicamente, porque decimos, ¿a qué horas va a regresar? Porque ocupamos nuestros refrigeradores para nuestras, nuestras um, medicinas. So, uh, each time that we have a shadow of on the electricity, we just go into panic mode because we have no idea when is it going to come back, what's going to happen. So it's not only physically, but also mentally, like psychologically, this is impacting us because we don't know what's going to happen with our medicines that are in the refrigerator. Entonces, me gustaría que tomen en cuenta nuestra, nuestra salud, que es lo más importante que tenemos. Y vuelvo y repito, que eh, es un derecho humano Cuando algo se convierte, cuando es una necesidad, se convierte en derecho humano para nuestras familias, nuestra comunidad y nuestra salud y bienestar. Yeah, so please, I, I beg you that you take into account what I'm saying because this is when there's a necessity, this is a human right. This is something that really is so important for our health, for our family, for our children, for our communities. Así que eso viene a abogar, no nada más por mi familia, sino que por toda la comunidad. Y vengo a abogar a sus, a sus nobles corazones. So I'm here to advocate not only for my family, but for the whole community. And I'm asking to your noble hearts. Gracias por, su, por darnos este espacio y escuchar nuestras necesidades. Y me gustaría quedar con esto. And El derecho you. humano. Let me just say this. Thank you for... Um, for here, for hearing us about our necessities, and I want to end with this statement. Yeah. So we have to do good, no matter who is there, to everybody, basically. So I once more, I beg to your noble hearts. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Robin Line, who will be followed by Andrea Olu Lee. So the gates help give people to smoke. So I just made sure the gates are out the camera. Why can't we do that? Good morning. My name is Robin, and I'm a member of SCOPE and Repower LA Coalition. Repower Coalition, we represent a diverse group of environmental justice, labor, and community-based organizations. I'm here today for a personal story. For two and a half days, our water was shut off, and we live in a 51-unit building, and no proper notice from our management or DWP was re received. And we were in the middle of a, a three-digit heat wave. So there was no water for us for personal hygiene. Personally, I came home to my uh, residence and no water at all. So, I, And I use filter water to take medication. I take medication three times a day. So I had to call and ask for water, for drinking water, and also water to flush our toilets. You know, we uh, couldn't prepare our meals for uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We have families uh, of four or more in there, so the added expense of having to go out and buy meals, and especially with the uh, scar, uh, skyrocketing uh, price of gas was really phenomenal. And uh, it's important that LA DWP you make a policy to stop the water and power shot us for low income and, and life residents, all residents, our seniors, everybody. Our bills are too high and we need a, a debt relief with affordable rates. And, uh, you know, we want a permanent solution to utility uh, shutoffs that don't put a burden on our already struggling communities. And, you know, shutoffs are inhumane and criminal, and we have nowhere else to go for service. So I want to thank you for your time and, and your listening, and I'll ask you again on behalf of everyone that stop utility shutoffs. Thank you very much.
The next speaker is Andrea Oluline, who will be followed by Jasmine Vargas. Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Andrea O'Loughlin, and I do work with the Repower campaign as an outreach specialist. So as Repower, we're here to represent a diverse group of individuals, and this includes um, environmental justice, labor, and community-based organizations. So I do outreach specifically for LADWP programs. Some of these programs include shared solar as well as commercial direct install. So that means that I am going street by street week by week, talking with business owners, with employees, I'm talking with landlords, and I'm also talking with tenants. That includes well-off tenants and some of the lowest income tenants that I've ever personally experienced. So when I have these experiences, I get to see how community members are having to make challenging decisions every day about the bills that they have to pay. I have been in the living rooms of people who have been fearful about their power getting shut off and how that's going to impact their children and the way that they experience their life in LA. Um, and additionally, climate change is an undeniable truth that has impacted us in LA as recent as this summer, and it's only going to be getting worse. People are already making decisions about whether to spend this money on their bills versus food for their household, and now they're dealing with the problem of that food spoiling or that medicine spoiling and then that money going absolutely wasted. So for me, as my personal experience as an outreach specialist, I feel like it's very important for LADWP to make a policy that stops water and power shutoffs for low income and lifeline residential customers. Thank you so much for your time today. Next speaker is Jasmine Vargas, who will be followed by Malcolm Johnson. Good morning, esteemed Board of Commissioners, I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today, especially being here standing in solidarity with our Repower LA Coalition members. My name is Jasmine Vargas, I'm Senior Organizer for Food and Water Watch, and I uh, fight climate change. I fight for community justice and energy justice, something that I've heard a lot from specifically President Mr. McLean Hill and others in terms of how we do this equitably has been a huge challenge, I think, for all of us. So I would like for you to all think about how important it's going to be as we're transitioning to a clean energy future, as we're fighting climate change and making sure that that's an equitable transition. How are you planning on doing that when people are already saddled with debt, especially the most vulnerable among us, the ones that um, need energy justice the most, those that are overburdened by the bills, but yet there's this philosophy that this institution carries that, that thinks of this as a, a luxury. Uh, how are we gonna get people to pay their bills if, if we, we're not threatening them with shutoffs? Like that's a bankrupt policy and that's not how energy justice is done. If you think about it, if we actually support those in our communities that are underserved, the lifeline customers that you've heard of today, the low income discount customers, all of those that we've talked about that could really use conservation and energy efficiency programs, if they were all to have a program that their water and power shutoffs won't go off, then they're not gonna be as disproportionately burdened as we're transitioning to that 100% clean energy future. And that way we can all start from the same place. That's what equity is about. And so I will keep fighting for that equity. I'm gonna keep fighting for these low income communities, the communities that are on the front lines of climate change, the ones that have the solutions and that are calling from you all to start envisioning that future, that clean energy future that we all are fighting for and working for because there really is no other choice. Thank you. The next speaker is Malcolm Johnson, who will be followed by L.B. Gonzalez. Alrighty. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. My name is Malcolm Johnson, and I'm coming from the Sierra Club, and we're here in coalition with our Repower partners. And basically, I just want to make it very clear, like, access to utilities is a human right. And we really need to work together to find a way to make sure that we are not doing the inhumane thing, which is to cut off people's access to power, cut off people's access to water. Um, I'm a resident, a long-term resident of Southern California. I have uh, grown up in LA and, you know, 
things have happened, right? <laughs> Just in my short lifetime, right? We've had multiple recessions, multiple wars, this and the third. People's finances can shift from day to day, moment to moment. We know so many people in this country, in this city, are paycheck to paycheck. So if people are living paycheck to paycheck and something happens, and now they have a choice between literally putting food in their family's bellies and keeping the lights on, and you're making them choose, you know, basically to starve themselves to death to keep <laughs> from having their power cut off, that's just a horribly horrific, inhumane thing to do. Let's just call it exactly what it is, acknowledge it, and let's find a way to make sure that this doesn't happen. And the difference between LADWP and a lot of other places is that this is an organization that's supposed to be for the residents of the city, first and foremost. So you all have a responsibility to protect those residents, even the ones who are falling on hard times. Let's think about it in that perspective. This is not a private utility. You guys are a public agency. You guys have a responsibility. So that's all I really have to say. You know, it's a very clear thing. Everybody here is grown. You guys have all probably had your own things that you've experienced when you've gone through your challenges and imagine what you could do if you can help somebody else that's in that situation. Thank you. The next speaker is LB Gonzalez, who will be followed by Ashoki Taluk Dar. Good morning, LADDWP. My name is Lisbeth Gonzalez Ruiz, and I'm with the Sierra Club and the Repower LA Coalition. I'm here today because it's very important for LADWP to make a policy that stops water and power shutoffs for low income families and lifelong residents who, lifeline residential customers. We urge you to implement a permanent solution to utility shutoff that does not put the burden on our already struggling communities. As a child, we experienced shutoffs. It was extremely dehumanizing. It was very challenging to see my parents pick between buying groceries or having utilities turned on. I do not want anybody else to experience that feeling, and I urge you guys to have a policy that supports frontline communities. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Ashoki Talukdar, who will be followed by Mark Dyer. Good morning, Commissioners and President Hill. And I apologize if you can't see me well. Uh, Odians and I have unresolved childhood issues. <laughs> uh, you've heard from some of my colleagues uh, at AIDS Healthcare Foundation, where I'm the Deputy General Counsel for Corporate Affairs. I joined this exceptionally compassionate organization about six years ago, and in the last five years, we have proceeded to establish a program, purchase buildings, rehabilitate them, and house about 1,200 of those 70,000 people that my colleague and Kim talked about that are on the streets. And we also told you that it is almost impossible, sometimes cost prohibitive, sometimes just simply not possible, to meter these units individually, and we don't want to. Why? Well, we've heard several testimonies about how Individual finances can change, and it sometimes puts people in this conflicting position of, do I put food on the table or keep the lights on? We don't want our tenants to face that problem, so we don't make them. We take care of these buildings, including the utilities, all out of our own pocket. We are looking for an extraordinary solution to an extraordinary crisis that this city faces. I see it every day, you see it every day, at every corner of every street. 20% of utilities, 20% of the total cost of housing going to utilities is not a sustainable program. We're asking for an extraordinarily sustainable program that can actually work. We ask you to come talk to us. We've been here probably three or four times before, and we'll probably be here again. We ask for that dialogue because our goal is that you're going to be, we're hoping that you're going to be able to establish a program where residents are paying or landlords who are taking care of the residents like us are paying no more than 5% of the per unit cost in utilities. And we hope that this is a sustainable program. We believe this is going to be a sustainable program because 20% of the cost simply is not. 
I thank you for your time and hope you will reach out to us. The next speaker is Mark Dyer, who will be followed by Jeremy Fuster. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Dyer. I'm the Vice President of Operations with the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. And um, I'm coming before you today just to reiterate what my colleagues have said. We are looking for a program that will assist us and our tenants in moving forward with reduced rates. We made contact here back in March, and a colleague of yours, Joseph Coe, reached out to us, had a discussion with us. Um, I interacted with several divisions of making recommendations, which we have already done as far as Title 24, LED lighting, and things of that nature. Um, we had another individual, Michael Bustamante, who spoke with Ms. McLean Hill, and um, had conversation, and we're looking for someone to reach out to us to work with us to accomplish what we're trying to do. Um, as we said, my colleagues, 20% is not sustainable. It, it, uh, over $150 per room for a uh, month for cost of electricity when these buildings don't have air conditioning and there's not a lot of th uh, things they operate. So if we could just make some dialogue, reach out, have communication and move forward, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just although we don't typically uh, have a lot of response to public comment, I do want to acknowledge that um, the AIDS Health Foundation has been here multiple times. You have been um, incredibly respectful and also have conveyed um, with increasing clarity the urgency um, and the dilemma that your organization faces. Um, I do look forward to uh, spending some time thinking about how we address um, this may be unique, maybe not. I don't know how many other entities are in your position, uh, but clearly um, there is, uh, I, I appreciate the degree to which our typical programs aimed at individuals don't work um, in this circumstance. And um, Marty would like to, um, to follow up in an appropriate way so that we can better understand how we might be more um, accommodating. Um, with uh, with uh, service providers of this kind, so thank you, and I appreciate you all. Thank you. The next speaker is Jeremy Fuster, who will be followed by Cameron Hurt. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, my name is Jeremy Fuster. I'm a volunteer with the uh, DSALA Climate Justice Committee and with uh, Repower LA. I'm speaking in support of Repower LA's presentation today. Um, four days ago, I was just down the hill here at City Hall for the youth climate strike, and I was talking with a bunch of people about the heat wave that we just gone through. And one of the people I spoke to was a high schooler who lives in South LA. And he was talking about how during the heat wave, he and his family were just trying to spend as much time as possible like out of their apartment, in libraries, at the grocery store, cooling centers, just because when they're back in their apartment, they have to keep the AC on. They have two ACs because of cool air doesn't flow through their apartment, and they're trying to make every single dollar count. Right now, with rising costs of food, gas, et cetera, they're trying to make every single dollar go as far as they can, and they haven't had a shut off yet, but it made them think about trying to save money on utilities. And as our climate crisis gets worse, as inflation continues to go on, we don't know how much longer inflation is gonna go, these are the sort of things that people are thinking about a lot of the lower lowest, lower lowest paying rate payers are struggling with trying to make ends meet and they shouldn't have to choose between putting food on the table and having to worry about these kinds of shut up notices. So the Climate Justice Committee is supporting Repower LA in this initiative. We hope you'll listen to their presentation today and that you will do everything you can to take the burden off of the rate payers who can at least afford to deal with these shutoffs. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Cameron Hurt, who will be followed by Teodoro Reyes. Good morning. Um, my name is Cameron Hurt. I have lived in Los Angeles for several years. I'm an LADWP ratepayer, and I just want to join uh, all the folks who have been speaking passionately from the heart about the need for a permanent solution as far as shutoffs and uh, the growing crisis of utility that is going. So. 
it's clear that a permanent solution is needed. I think that it's been made clear by all of these speakers that the future is truly, it's necessary that the future is one that includes all of the low income people who are at risk of shut off. And I believe that it's fair to say, I feel confident saying that the majority of people, whether it's in Los Angeles or across the country, are in support of something that stops shutoffs permanently because anytime that someone's water or power is shut off, it truly is an inh inhumane situation. Uh, it's something that can truly ruin a day, it can ruin a lifetime, and anything that can be done to make this a thing of the past must be done. Um, I truly want to say that when we hear the stories of people who have gone through shutoffs, who have experienced it because they can't pay, um, it's something that can shock and something that can uh, leave permanent damage. So the only way to move forward and to solve this is to make sure that there's a policy uh, that stops water and power shutoffs. And I look forward to hearing the recommendations that are going to come out. And immediate action is clearly needed because shutoffs are inhumane. It's a tragedy when they do happen. And water and power are human rights, and we must continue to fight and do everything within our power to make them truly those human rights, uh, whether it's here or anywhere else. So. The power is definitely in the hands of the folks in this room. Um, and I just want to say that all the diverse speakers who have come up to say different things represent the will of the majority of people. And therefore, it would be excellent to see something powerful come out of today's meeting and future meetings. Thank you. The next speaker is Teodora Reyes, who will be followed by Melissa Walk. <coughs> I'm board secretary. How many additional speakers do we have? We are on number 15 of 23. Of 23? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning, LADWP board. My name is Teodora Reyes, and I am with Pacoima Beautiful and the Repower LA Coalition. Um, the Repower LA Coalition represents a diverse group of environmental justice, labor, and community-based organizations. And I'm here today because families and communities um, and Angelinos should not have to choose between a meal and utilities um, and their right to their human right to access water and power especially our most vulnerable Angelinos who continue to live paycheck to paycheck in the midst of the aftermath of our um, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, water and energy and all utilities are human right, yet by POC communities often go without the longstanding historical and systemics, um, due to the longstanding historical and systemic injustices. Um, the LADWP um, has shut off water, has shut off water and power after this moratorium. And during that time, working families faced increasing cost of living expenses, as well as access to their water and power. And in the midst of the pandemic, um, it's become a crucial element to the basic needs and safe quality um, of life for Angelinos. So um, we all know that our basic needs are very important to us. And many members here today have spoken upon the realities of having to choose between their medicine, no uses, um, their right to, you know, the, this, this heat wave, for example, caused a lot of our families to have to choose to sleep outside. And a lot of our members, and even yourselves, would not want to have to sleep outside because of how hot it is in your home. Many of our families have more than just one. In one household, there's more than one family. And, um, you know, has many bodies as can fit in a house. It can get really hot. So um, we are here today to ask for a no shut offs um, policy that will help benefit our communities instead of um, having to do, deal with the cost of choosing between their housing or utilities. So thank you so much for your time and all your efforts. And I hope that um, we continue to look for recommendations and take into consideration what's gonna be presented today. And hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Walk, who will be followed by Anna Karen Ramirez. Thank you so much. Here we go. Um, good morning, LADWP board. My name is Melissa Walk, and I'm the mem a member 
of Pacoma Beautiful and also the Repower LA Coalition. Um, it is very important for LADWP to make a policy that stops water and power shutoffs for low income and lifetime residential customers. We want a permanent solution to utility shutoffs that does not put the burden on our already struggling communities. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Anna Karen Ramirez, who will be followed by Olivia Walker. Good morning, LADWP board. My name is Anna Karen, and I'm a member of Pacoima Beautiful and the Repower LA Coalition. Our organization directly supports community members applying for utility assistance programs, and I'm uh, here today to urge LADWP to make a policy that stops water and power shutoffs for low income and lifeline residents, uh, residential customers. In one of the wealthiest and most powerful cities in the world, um, it's inhumane to deny people access to their most basic necessities. Utility shutoffs are not an incentive, but a cruel punishment. Though the city is shifting away from responding to the pandemic as if it were no longer a crisis, our communities are still recovering and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And in the wake of the moratorium ending, it's critical for DWP to look at permanent solutions for debt relief and a no shutoffs policy to protect its most vulnerable customers. Instead, LADWP should invest more resources in improving access to their programs and addressing things like language and technical barriers to support their customers rather than threatening to cut their services. We need a permanent solution to utility shutoffs and that, does, that doesn't continue to place a burden on our already vulnerable communities. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Olivia Walker, who will be followed by Mari Tovar. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, members of the board. My name is Olivia Walker, and I'm with NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, I also have the pleasure of working with the Repower LA Coalition, uh, and I'm also here as a Los Angeles resident. I'm here today in support of the policies and programs that will be recommended by the Repower Coalition to ease utility debt burden, stop shutoffs for low and, and stop shutoffs for low income and lifeline residents. As we all know, uh, shutoffs are a symptom of the ongoing and ever escalating affordability crisis faced by residents across the city, and shutoffs only serve to compound the burdens faced by residents, uh, the same residents that LADWP is charged with serving. Uh, and many of today's speakers have expressed to you uh, many stories uh, sharing their experiences with that. Uh, the answer to this crisis is not cutting residents off from essential resources. It's creating long-term solutions that guarantee energy justice for those who need it the most. We strongly urge you to implement permanent policies and programs to alleviate utility debt burden and shutoffs and ensure long-term energy affordability for all Angelinos. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Mari Tovar, who will be followed by Ara Vasquez. Hi, good morning. My name is Mari Tovar. I'm with Pacoima Beautiful's Empowerment Program. I'm here to ask you that you stop shutoffs and work with community members who are financial victims of the pandemic. I'm asking that you stop their human right to electricity. This is a human necessity. The financial hardship they face is something they've never encountered before. These are families living paycheck to paycheck and many went without income for months or years. They face the hardship of um, the hard choice of buying food or paying down their utility bill. We are asking for you to help and assist our community members to re regain control of their utility debt and bring their accounts current. These are willing community members who have a spe um, specific circumstances. I ask that you have a unit dedicated to deal with special circumstances, because even though we have assistant programs like the Lee Heap, um, which is uh, of no use for those without a social security number, there are also the Easy Save Low Income Discount programs. I've uh, helped many community members apply. However, when I've checked back with them, they don't see much of a difference due to the extreme temperatures we're experiencing. Angelinos don't have the luxury of shopping for cheaper rates. You're the only option they have, so please work with us, help the communities that depend on you. Thank you.
so fresh and so clean here. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Commissioner. I'm Aura Vasquez. I'm a former commissioner here for LADWP. It's great to see everyone here. I'm here before you to humbly ask you to develop a policy that will allow um, and avoiding uh, shed offs for water and power for many Angelinos struggling, especially now after the pandemic. I myself know firsthand what it's like to have to choose between groceries and paying for your bill. And my story is not unique. While I was a commissioner here and in my office hours, I learned about so many families that are actually living today with no water and power. And in a, in a city as rich as ours, with some of the wealthiest zip codes, with the largest public utility in the country, this shouldn't be the case. And I, 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 I trust that you all are working towards a common goal where we can have a policy to help those Angelinos that are struggling today. Um, I wanna uh, take uh, a moment to show my gratitude for the enormous uh, leadership that Commissioner McHill has shown in this issue. I trust that all of you will take this on at heart, just like so many others are, um, are taking it today, especially with the Repower LA Coalition and the so many other organizations uh, that are here. I cannot stress enough that maybe some of you might not have direct experience with this, but there are hundreds of people out there that need your support and your help today. So thank you so much for your consideration, and I hope that next time we can come here and celebrate a policy that will help Angelinos in, in need right now. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner, it's very good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. It's good to see everyone. So many new faces. It's great <laughs> to see everyone here. Thank you. The next speaker will be Andrea Ramirez, who will be followed by Maria Rutile. Hello, uh, my name is Andrea Callejas Ramirez. I'm a resident of Los Angeles. And I came to implore you to please uh, take our communities into account and provide a permanent solution. Um, I myself, like a lot of members of my community, I did see the impacts of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of, I lost a lot of members of my family because of the pandemic. And it was very unjust for my family to have to decide help our own families or pay our bills. Um, just because we're seeing the light to the end of the pandemic doesn't mean that the impacts of losing our families are just disappearing. Um, my family, we still have very high um, electricity bills. And at the same time, we're still, we didn't lose only one family member. We lost more than nine individuals in our family. Imagine that impact in our family for us to be able to think about the bills. It, it just became very inhumane. I graduated this year, and for me, it didn't feel like a celebration. It felt like a burden for myself um, to like see how my family was still actively trying to gather money for my education, actively actively trying to look for money for you know, our family members that we lost, and at the same time still think about the bills that we had to pay. So I beg you to please um, look at the community members that you're still covering. We don't, we don't only have people who have high income jobs. We also, also have members of our community like this one's here. That we, we have, Even when we work every day, we still cannot come up with like the bills that we are getting every day after the pandemic's over. So please, I think into account, we need a permanent solution for, for the water and bills. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Maria Rutledge, who will be followed by Ignacio Gutierrez. Maria Rutledge was unable to come into the meeting. Thank you. The next speaker is Ignacio Gutierrez. He's in the overflow. Can, Can I please take Guadalupe Rivas? Can I please take Anthony Ballesteros? Okay. Ignacio. 
Hi, good morning, a -level report. My name is Ignacio Gutierrez, and I'm a member of SCOPE and the Repower LA Coalition. Uh, the LADW Fidel has affected me in a way that uh, my uh, water and, and um, power was shut off, and I'm afraid of uh, my food going rotten, not washing my dishes, not being able to wash my dishes, and eat and uh, have to eat outside. Uh, please consider that during the pandemic. During the pandemic, my work hours got cut off, and I and I started owing money, then have enough money to pay my bill, so my power got shut off. And uh, please pardon our debt during the pandemic and bills. Uh, try to lo lower our bills because we low-income families don't have enough money to pay if we go because we live check by check. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you. Guadalupe Rivas. Anthony Ballesteros. Muy buenos días, miembros del concilio. Mi nombre es Antonio Ballesteros y soy residente del sur de Los Ángeles. Este, estoy inconforme con los precios del agua, del water and power y muy altos los pueblos. Son un cargo para mi economía y aparte de eso para todo el público, para todos los sur centro, los que tienen escasos recursos. Es una cosa muy importante. Okay, so good morning. My name is Antonio. Ballesteros. Ballesteros, and I'm a resident of the south of Los Angeles, and I'm, um, I, I am uh, not, I don't agree with the prices of the water and power. They are very high, and it's a burden for my economy, not only my economy, but all the people that live in my area. Otra cosa muy importante, les he llamado al departamento de water and power que el agua sale sucia de la tubería. Another important thing is, and I've called the department to, to say that the water is very dirty. The water is coming out dirty out of the faucet. Una cosa mucho muy importante, ahí la, la economía de todas las personas de Sur Centra, la mayoría son de escasos recursos y es muy poco el sueldo que ganan para pagar los altos precios que tiene el departamento de Warren Power. En South Central, most of the families are low income and it is really we don't have enough money to pay for the high prices that we get from LADWP. Lo más importante aquí es que ustedes como representantes del departamento de Warren Power y que trabajan para la mayoría trabajamos para la comunidad, les pido que por favor ayuden a la comunidad y a, ayuden a todas las personas. Lo más importante es que pongan atención En, en, en los precios y en las personas que hacen. Y yo, en lo personal, he hecho cuatro aplicaciones al departamento de Warren Power y hasta la fecha no me han reducido nada el bill. She says that he already made like four, she, he already filled in like four applications to, and still to the moment he hasn't got any reduction in the bill. So he's really begging that you pay attention to these high prices for all their people, the community. Mandaron una persona del departamento de Warren Power a Scope, supuestamente para que le llenáramos las aplicaciones. Se llenaron las aplicaciones y hasta la fecha no he recibido una respuesta. Creo que es, esto es inconsciente porque cuando menos no calificas o calificas o esto es lo que vamos a hacer contigo. So there's one person that was sent to Scope to help them fill in the applications and they did. They filled in like four applications. And they didn't get any response, not even like saying, yes, you qualified or not, you do not qualified. And this is what we're going to do, how we're going to work it out. They didn't just got any response. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a los representantes. Muchas gracias. Thank you por very much to all of you for paying attention. Thank you. Guadalupe Rivas. Buenas tardes, el ley de DWP Board. 
Mi nombre es Guadalupe Rivas, soy miembro de SCOP y organización Repower LA Coalition. De Repower Coalition representa diferentes grupos de justicia, labor y comunidades basadas en organizaciones. Good afternoon, um, commissioners of the LADWP board. My name is Guadalupe Rivas, and I'm a member of SCOP and from the organization of, of Repower, the coalition Repower LA and Repower Coalition represents different groups of justice, labor, and communities based in different organizations. Yo estoy aquí porque represento a personas de bajos uh, recursos que debido a la inflación de precios en todo el costo de vida, alimentos, renta, gastos de hijos, gastos de universidades, etcétera, costos mínimos, los cuales es difícil suplir y uh, Okay, so I am here because I represent uh, the persons of uh, low income and due to the inflation and the higher prices, um, it's all the cost of our life and of our groceries and of our life in general, all the, the expenses that we have with our children and the rent, uh, all these minimum cost, it is like really difficult to afford. Además, y además el recibo de la luz que está exageradamente alto eh, en un costo de que hace dos años costaba 150 dólares, ahora está a un costo de 300 dólares debido a que estos calores han estado demasiado altos. Estos calores eh, de, había necesidad de poner el aire acondicionado y personas que no lo ponían por el motivo de que tenían que, que este, no tenían el dinero para pagar el recibo de la luz. Also, the, um, the the price of the energy went up so much. It went from 150 to 300. It doubled this year because it's been so hot, and we can, and, and some of us that need to turn on the air conditioning, we cannot afford it. So we cannot even turn on the air conditioning because we don't want to spend so much money. Los bebés, mi hija tiene dos, be dos bebés este, y necesitan ellos también aire acondicionado y teníamos que dejar de prender el aire acondicionado para llevarlos al parque porque el, no podemos alcanzar para pagar el, el costo del mensual de la, de la electricidad. Es muy alto el costo mensual. So my daughter has two babies and they really need to have the air conditioning on, but instead we had to take them to the park because we really cannot afford to leave the air conditioning on the whole day. Ya que no hay igualdad en cuanto al ingreso de salarios y el costo de la vida comparado con el, el recibo de la luz. No hay igualdad en cuanto a eso por el motivo de que hay personas que a lo mejor en residencias, en lugares donde son eh, residentes de que reciben más income o algo, pagan exactamente igual que lo que pagamos nosotros y nosotros tenemos un ingreso mínimo y no hay una igualdad en cuanto al cobro del recibo de la luz. Entonces, eso nos me parece justo. So he, she feels that it's not fair, the lack of um, equality, that uh, for people that have like, you know, they, they, they basically spend the same them that they are low income as the bills are the same as those who are like really high income. So she finds that this is not fair because for them it's a lot harder to pay um, these bills. Suplicamos que no nos corten el agua y hagan un estudio de bajar el precio a la igualdad del ingreso en cuanto a las familias. So they're uh, begging that please do not shut off the um, energy or the water. And if you can take in consideration to make like uh, more equal, to help more those who have low income. Muchas gracias. Agradezco por habernos puesto esta atención. Thank you for your attention. Gracias. Public comment is now closed. <clears throat> thank you. Um, uh, thank you, and before moving uh, into the rest of the meeting, I want to uh, just acknowledge the time and effort it takes for people to come and to address our board meeting. Uh, for us, it's you know, an hour of listening patiently, but for them, it's getting up and getting, you know, traveling long distances for simply two minutes to speak. And uh, um, and I appreciate uh, their participation. Um, 
we, uh, as you know, will have a, we have a workshop on debt relief um, and are joined by uh, a number of outside presenters. Uh, I think I'm going to move that, advance that on the agenda. Um, so uh, Marty, if we could briefly go through uh, the general manager and chief engineer reports, that would be great. And I think from there, um, we will jump down to um, the uh, 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 item I, and then we'll go to item J um, to management reports. We have, I'd like to just point out that we have a, in addition to the agenda and to the dais, that is our inspector general, uh, and he will be making a presentation today as well. Uh, but that will follow our management our management report presentation. So uh, that will be the order, Marty. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, first, I just wanted to highlight, and it has a, a very pertinent to the discussions we heard this morning. Uh, we launched our Cool LA program uh, two Fridays ago. Um, uh, President McLean Hill, and myself, uh, and Mayor Garcetti, as well as uh, folks from Pacoma Beautiful, were there in. Uh, uh, at a Valley Senior Center in Panorama, Panorama City. Um, you know, the Cool LA is initiative was brought by this board. Uh, it really is designed to promote our new and existing programs and gather them under one large umbrella. Uh, the event was highlighted by the uh, tripling of our air conditioning rebate program for portable air conditioners for eligible customers uh, based on income or in other, in other uh, living situations. Uh, I just got word last night that in the last uh, almost two weeks since that started, we've had 305 families take advantage of this that has received over $68,000 in rebates. Um, we've also had the online marketplace uh, become active as well as the rebate on point of sale so that you don't have to put the money out front. You can actually get the rebate and have less out of pocket expense. The other thing that we launched with that was the level bill pay option. And that was to allow people to uh, levelize their payments over the course of the year. So as we heard so many speakers talked about uh, being concerned about turning on the air conditioning because of the impact on the bill, being able to look at their their billing history and levelize that payment so there's no ups and downs over the course of the year. Um, real briefly, like Nancy, just to talk about the Clean Air Day coming up. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah. Um, once again, uh, sorry. Uh, once again, DWP will be uh, co-sponsoring California's fifth annual Clean Air Day on October 5th. Um, and this is a statewide effort to raise awareness around uh, our continuing air pollution problems. And so uh, we are inviting employees to uh, take a clean air pledge um, to uh, raise awareness and to um, do any of the things that uh, we can to support Clean Air Day, um, such as you know, walking or biking to, to school or to store, um, uh, helping our kids with um, reports and classes on the environment. Um, and then we'll also be hosting a resource fair here at, um, at JFB uh, where people can learn more about things we can do uh, to uh, help clean the air. Uh, and there's a little bit of a competition going on among the utilities in California. And uh, we've been uh, told that we're doing okay, but uh, a little behind some of the others. So we encourage everybody to participate. Thank you. And uh, I'll just close my report by saying that uh, we just got word from the mayor's office yesterday, this should be our last meeting that we have to wear masks. Uh, mask mandates will be uh, removed citywide on Monday at city facilities and we'll be putting out uh, employee video and some guidance this week on that. But uh, relief is close at hand. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my report. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any comments or questions from uh, any member of the board? Yeah, just one really quick question, Nancy. Did you say that this was the fifth Clean Air Day? So it's only been five yeah. years? So th this, uh, this is an annual event put on by the Coalition for Clean Air. Okay. Uh, so they're really, so it's, uh, the it's really aimed at, yeah, okay. so at uh, encouraging people to take the steps that they can take to help clean the air and raise awareness. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no other questions or comments at this time, um, I'd like to go to item um, to item I on our agenda. Uh, items recommended for approval. And let me just look at my notes in that regard. I know that items M3 and 
M4 have been deferred. Uh, item M2 is being called special by uh, Vice President uh, Ruiz, which means that at this point, um, is there, I'll make a motion to approve items M1, M5, and M6. Second. Would you call the roll? Commissioner Lehrer? I'm looking at M1. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Four ayes, motion adopted. Uh, I don't Three think Three ayes, motion yes. adopted, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Laird, do you intend to vote? Yes, I, I will. I haven't followed what M1 was. Thank you. Yes, you're voting aye, so it's four ayes. Thank eyes. you. Yes, thank you. And uh, so thank you for that. We'll move to management reports, uh, starting with our debt relief workshop. And the first presenters are from UCLA's Luskin School, uh, Greg Pierce and Rachel Scheinberg. And thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having us. I'd also like to point out that they are supporting UCLA Luskin and in particular, uh, Greg um, and Rachel, I believe made presentations too and are supporting the uh, LADWP equity strategies project. And some of this information was presented to our equity strategy steering committee. Um, but uh, we thought would be important as a foundational information for the board as we continue to look at debt uh, relief, debt management, and issues related to debt burden. So uh, with that, I appreciate your being here. Thank you. Thank you to the board. Um, can you all hear me? Yep. Excellent. So I'm Greg Pierce, co-director of the UCLA Luskin Center for Innovation, joined by my colleague, Rachel Scheinberg at the UCLA Institute of the Environment. And try to be brief, but we're going to briefly cover topics um, broadly on customer utility affordability, drawing in particular on our experience working with LA 100 equity strategies, but also a much broader work in the space, and then focusing in on debt, customer debt, and shutoff policy in particular. So briefly, uh, LA 100 equity strategies is a effort commissioned by LA DDBP and it involves both the National Renewable Energy Lab as well as a number of folks at UCLA, including ourselves, to help LEDWP and the community um, come up with strategies to make the transition to 100% renewable energy and uh, what was known as LA100 equitable. Our work is focused on uh, affordability, but there's a number of elements to that project. Um, happy to discuss that later if we have time. Just to get on the same page about some of the terms I'll be using here, I know this is too many words, but, and I know if there's any economists in the room, uh, you may have checked to the terms. Um, but I wanna say, first of all, that customer affordability, utility affordability is among the most key considerations, really that, that we here raised um, around equity and LADWP certainly is a key, if not the key, key consideration in LA 100 equity strategies. The transition cost um, toward 100% renewable energy only makes it uh, more urgent to be discussing this issue because the cost is considerable and necessitates additional utility revenue. Revenue is primarily, uh, almost exclusively for LADDBP, uh, recovered through rates paid by customers, which uh, are not just residential customers, which we'll, we'll talk about later, um, but there are few external sources of subsidy for LADDBP as a public utility. And then affordability, the key term I'll be using over and over here, I'm really referring to customers' ability to pay their bill, the bulk of which reflects rates. And I do wanna note that there, not only is there the cost of moving to 100% renewable energy that will be f reflected on LADWP bills, but also effectively the cost that people currently pay for natural gas and gasoline will be folded into the LADWP bill as we are successful in moving to full building and transport electrification. So a lot more people, what people pay is going to be through the LADWP uh, power portion of their bill inherently, and thus heightens the, the need to address affordability um, holistically. 
Um, I'm going to, you know, run through a, a few highlights of why affordability matters and the particular ways it matters for LADWP. The first I want to note is that for customers, really, it's the whole LADWP bill that matters, and LADWP has the unique challenge, which I know also brings a lot of efficiencies and is very convenient for a lot of other customers, but has a unique challenge for low-income customers that there are up to four services that they have to pay in their bill. Um, they can't choose which of those services they're going to pay for, um, and it's, it's a higher burden unless measures are taken, which I know some of which are being taken, um, especially when the, the bill is traditionally bi-monthly, to pay for all four of those services at a single time, as opposed to um, having them separated and having options like levelized billing that's already been mentioned as being rolled out. I'm sorry, I don't understand that slide. I need a few more seconds on it. What's, there are these different customer buckets or discount programs and whether they, uh, they qualify for these um, discounts in these buckets, is that what's going on? I'm not sure. I, can you explain? Yeah, the chart? sure. It's it's showing you for different types of of discount or assistance programs that LADDVP operates. Those being Easy Save, Lifeline, or Lifeline Plus, Life Support, PCD. Which uh, services those customers pay on their bill? Um, and I should note that it's most common. But again, there are. 15 different combinations, depending on customer that you are, which which services you're going to pay on a bill. Um, but it's it's very common for low income customers, in particular, to not directly pay for water, um, as well as to some extent, um, especially sewer, and to some extent trash, because those those services are master metered. But this is showing you again a lot of information about which services those customers who are enrolled in these programs have to pay directly on their bill. Okay, so what's the takeaway from this slide? What, what am I supposed to derive from it? Uh, that for customers who have to pay their whole bill and traditionally in order not to be shut off, that having four services on a bill potentially um, and, and having to pay that bill by monthly is more of a burden because low income households struggle to pay larger one off bills as opposed to smaller uh, bills that come at different times. Okay. All right, the, the second point I have, which I think has been shown in, in many other contexts is not unique to LADWP, but this is drawing on, on data that LADWP publicly released at near, near the onset, or six months, I should say, into the COVID pandemic around um, utility debt burden due to residential utility debt burden um, and customer debt that was not paid on bills. And effectively, again, there's a lot going on this graphic. We could talk about the slide for a long time. Um, but this is showing that low income communities in Los Angeles City tend to have higher residential debt burdens um, than higher income communities, and particularly that there's a higher debt burden, even if you use statistical techniques to control for income among communities of color. And this has been shown, again, early on with, with this data, as well as additional data analysis done in the city of LA and many, many other contexts. This is a pretty universal finding has especially been highlighted since the onset of the pandemic around communities of color, low-income communities of color, um, having higher utility debt burdens. Uh, to turn a, a little more positively, um, I also want to highlight, and again, this is using data that was made available um, from LADWP, that low income, those who are enrolled in the, the major two assistance programs for um, income or otherwise in need households, the Lifeline and Easy Save programs uh, represent relatively little of the revenue uh, that LADWP derives from its residential customers, I think around 7% in or 8% in 2021. And I should note here um, that residential revenue only represents, I believe, around a third of the revenue on the power side for LADWP as a whole. So when you think about assisting, potentially further assisting or potentially giving further leniency around repayment for these customers, it does not appear at the highest level to, to impose a large revenue impact on the utility. I'll return to this point later. 
and perhaps we can discuss um, down the line. I also want to note, because um, there's been a lot of discussion around programs, around policies that's, uh, you know, that, are, that are necessary, um, that you know, besides rate structure and, and lowering the bill up front, programs and policies are necessary to support affordability. Um, and program policy design is very important, but what's equally necessary is helping folks enroll in those programs. Even if the best program is set up that provides uh, holistic support, but people aren't aware of it, people don't trust it, people aren't able to enroll in it, people aren't able to stay in it, it's not effective at supporting affordability. That's an ongoing effort that every utility has to undertake to ensure that there's high enrollment in the programs the utility rolls out. Is, is there um, a suggestion here that there are program, discount programs for um, earners of, with high income? I, mean, I would argue that some of these numbers are high income. What's that? Um, there appear to be some high incomes on here. Mm -hmm. And is, are, are you suggesting there are programs that hi, high income earners are eligible for? Yes, this is, I mean, this is a survey question asked by Loyola and Marymount University to City of LA residents actually commissioned by LADDVP, but it's asking more generically about a broader suite of discount programs, some of which high income households would be eligible for. Okay. I'm including this slide. I could show you many, many slides illustrating that within whatever the eligibility parameters for a program would be, um, lower income customers tend to not be aware not of those now. programs, okay. trust them or enroll in them. Okay. But yes, this You're is actually including some income. programs that higher income el customers okay. would be eligible for. Okay. I was gonna say that's my take, my big takeaway is around the communications relative to folks in the low income uh, bucket. Um, I'm gonna breeze through this <laughs> because I wanna get specifically to the debt and shutoff issue, but essentially this is a way of categorizing what I see as the major means to support utility affordability, and really it's a continuum um, with the, the measures up front um, being more upstream to the, the measures at the below, uh, particularly the one we're discussing today, crisis assistance, debt and shutoff relief, um, being uh, well, in some ways the least holistic or, or the most triage measure. Um, I would maintain that even if you do all of the above um, and, and address the first five categories, which in many ways LADDVP is, is making an effort to do on both the water, well, especially on the power, but also the water side, um, that you still need to have a program. You're still gonna have folks who are gonna have debt and not be able to pay their bill. You're still gonna have to address the issue of shutoffs. Um, and I would also maintain that, yes, you want to actually employ multiple of these measures. You can't just choose one or probably even three. I'm not sure if you need to do all six, but you're gonna to have to employ a package of three to four to be effective. And I really won't belabor this uh, because uh, I want to allow others to talk, but uh, affordability and the issue particularly of debt and shutoffs has been emphasized as a priority by the steering committee of LA 100 equity strategies as a, a topic for us to do further analysis on and, and for their research. Um, so we did a first stage analysis of eight different affordability metrics and eight different affordability policy categories and shutoffs and crisis relief rose to the top in the priorities of, of that effort. Coming to the topic of, of direct focus here, um, I want to emphasize that COVID, the pandemic, changed the shutoff policy discussion in a way I haven't seen an equity policy discussion change in such a short period of time in any, any other sphere. There was really very little talk about, especially shutoff moratoria for utility services before the pandemic. But very quickly after that, um, many states and, and then many individual utilities impose shutoff moratoria and maintain them for some time. This is simply a map again to illustrate where, the, where there were moratoria at, at an early stage or a moderate stage of the pandemic. 
Um, of course, LADWP had a morat moratoria on both power and water shutoffs and has maintained that um, for a longer period than most utilities, um, especially around the country, um, but even within the state. And I do wanna emphasize that LADWP has done a lot on debt relief and on shutoff policy, but also that as we heard that the public's expectation and really the policy expectation has changed dramatically. The, the line has shifted in, in terms of what is expected um, for debt relief and shutoff policy due to the COVID pandemic, due to an underlining of something that was always there, but was explicitly um, put into um, law and regulation around water and power being essential services that are mandatory for public health. And in the category of voluntary, what, how does that, how is that differentiated between the others? I mean, these are state policies for power um, passed on. Voluntary would be utilities can choose to participate. These are state moratoria. Again, there's so much variation that I couldn't show you um, on a map uh, at the utility level, but yeah, these are state moratoria. Uh, and I would also maintain um, that debt and low income residential debt in particular is a manageable problem for utilities, large utilities. I would maintain based on the evidence that I've seen, and I'm speaking beyond one of the greatest strategies here and um, uh, based on a larger portfolio of research and engagement, that arguments against debt and shut off leniency for low income customers are not plausibly about revenue recovery. I have yet to see evidence that there's a revenue case um, for shutting off low income residential customers. I think the burden of proof is on utilities to show that. I would be interested in seeing evidence if that is the case, but I have again yet to see it. I think there are some unanswered questions if moratoria are extended for certain customer classes that need to be explored, um, but especially the experience of the moratoria, the financials of large utilities, including um, the, the reports of their, the, the credit agencies to me suggest that again, from a revenue perspective, um, shutoffs are not necessary for low income and otherwise in need customers. Otherwise, um, besides legal arguments, especially for publicly owned utilities such as LADWP, I don't see um, arguments being valid. In many cases, the arguments for reinstituting shutoffs on low income or otherwise need residential customers are anecdotal and biased, in some case, classist and racist. I'm not speaking about utility arguments, but the arguments out in the public. Um, and of course, I, I do wanna note there will be cases of abuse. There will be anecdotes of folks uh, misusing any protections and any social programs, those exist, but they don't represent the majority. And if anything, the evidence I've seen, again, welcome other evidence is that low income, otherwise in need of residential customers are just as likely or not much less likely to pay their bills, including under a moratoria. Last but not least, come to um, ways to limit shutoffs or you know eliminate shutoffs. Again, LADWP is doing a lot on this front. It's doing a lot to try to reduce bill liability upfront. It's following due procedure, including SB, SB 998 and other state regulations. It's extending repayment and it's introducing leveling plans. It's increasing or making it easier to enroll in the Easy Save program. But I think it needs to also consider either expanding or existing approaches or, or new approaches, including keeping a shutoff moratoria all the way from just related to climate events to all customers, although likely somewhere in between that. Again, focus on low income, otherwise in need residential customers that can be paired with audits and or sort of aggressive messaging, especially to higher income customers and non-residential customers to pay their bills that I think can um, lead to at least sufficient revenue for the utility. There are also other options and sort of informal approaches that require discretion, what I call um, sort of quiet moratoria where there aren't explicit um, moratoria or, or firm policies, but working with customers and effectively imposing a moratoria without necessarily announcing it on all types of 
in need customers. And I do think there's a need potentially for ongoing debt relief funds. I know that there are one-off federal and state debt, debt relief funds that have been distributed by LADWP. But again, this issue of debt and shutoffs will not be going away post the pandemic. And so there's a need for relieving debt over time, um, either from the utility or the state level. With that, I'm gonna pass things off to my colleague, Rachel Schenberg. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, so I'm going to pivot slightly topically from a lot of the things that we've been discussing today, although I would argue this is all extremely relevant, um, and I hope you <laughs> agree. So my name is Rachel Scheinberg. I'm a researcher at UCLA's Institute of Environment and Sustainability, as well as with the UCLA School of Law. Um, as a part of the LA 100 Equity Strategies Project, I'm working in collaboration with Greg and the Luskin team, um, researching the topic of energy affordability specifically. And this work has included documenting rate making and assistance programs um, in other utilities across the country, as well as looking into the legal and regulatory constraints that the department faces in its own rate making, uh, which is going which is what I'm going to discuss a bit more today. So the goal of this slide is just to emphasize that there are many agencies and governing documents that constrain how LADWP sets electricity rates. These exist at the municipal, state, and to a lesser extent, federal levels. So DWP must comply with California's constitution, including propositions 13, 218, and 26, as well as with laws set by California Congress and regulatory bodies such as the California Energy Commission. At the Los Angeles level, the, deport, the board and department's actions must comply with the city's charter, municipal and administrative codes, city council ordinances, and executive directives. And finally, for issues involving transmission and sales of power or power purchases across state lines, the department is also beholden to federal energy regulatory commissions. So there's a lot of things going on. Next slide. Thanks, Greg. So when discussing affordability and rate making for municipal utilities in California, questions about Propositions 26 and 218 inevitably come up. Um, for that reason, I think it's important to look at the historical traje trajectory of these relevant tax-related propositions, um, starting with Proposition 13 in 1978, which cut property taxes to 1% of property values. Um, Proposition 218 in 1996, which limited the ability of municipal governments to levy non-property taxes uh, without voter consent. And finally, Proposition 26, adopted in 2010, which expanded the definition of taxes to cover many potential fees and costs imposed by municipal governments and municipal utilities. These propositions, along with the slew of other local, state, and federal regulations, clearly present the department with challenges, especially when it comes to implementing targeted affordability programs and more complex rate designs that can benefit um, both the grid and the most vulnerable customers. My goal with this research and this presentation is to begin the process of breaking down these challenges so that LADWP and the residents of Los Angeles can understand and work to surmount them, uh, thus ensuring that the city's goal of reaching 100% renewable energy is achieved in an equitable way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's not as very complicated. That concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions uh, before we move to the next presentation? No? Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you. And appreciate your work with LA Equity Strategies. And for this presentation is followed by uh, one from George Raphael. Uh, well, well, George is uh, coming up to the table. This mic is working. Um, I just want to make a couple of c comments. He's going to um, go through some of what we've been doing uh, around customer bill assistance. Um, and I think as, as the previous presenters noted, we are doing uh, a, a lot, I think a lot um, compared to other utilities. Um, and I just wanted to, before we, before we start, just to clarify, we have not uh, shut anybody off for non-payment. Um, for the last two and a half years. Um, we haven't purposefully blacked anyone out or cut off their service. And we continue not to charge late fees or report people to credit bureaus. Um, so just wanted to introduce uh, George and there'll be a couple other pre presenters with him. 
and water as well, correct? I mean, you said not That's right. power, correct. but you meant water as well, okay. Thank you. Uh, good, good morning, commissioners. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so uh, thank you for providing time for this present uh, briefing. I'll provide an update on our customer bill assistance efforts. And then Matt Hill, Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs, will provide a related legislative update. And Joe Romalo, Senior AGM for Corporate Strategy and Communications, will provide an update on outreach efforts. The pandemic impacted our customers in a number of significant ways, one of which is with their utility bills, causing many to fall behind with their bills. This impact was felt by the majority of our customer segments from our large commercial industrial to our residential and low-income customers. We recognize that the recovery requires quite a, lot, quite a lot of work and specifically from us to help customers manage their water and power bills and to avoid collections. And for us, operationally speaking, the recovery doesn't mean going back to how we previously operated, which is why we have not yet started collection shutoffs, even though the moratorium ended April 1st. As the LEDWP is committed to ensuring that every customer has equitable access to water and power, we are focused on better understanding the needs of our customers, communities, and industries that we serve and understanding the challenges that they may face in utilizing available services and programs and in getting the support and help they need. This requires us to invest in understanding our customer needs, re-examining our processes and policies, improving accessibility and engagement, equipping our employees with the necessary tools and information, and implementing new programs and services. So we've been doing this by getting customer feedback and input from community and labor partners, and collaborating with local, state, and federal agencies to identify and define these changes. We've compiled and analyzed a lot of data that I'll share today. This includes customer service related information, customer insights from surveys and interactions, uh, information from partners such as community-based organizations, research institutes and sister agencies, and from a US Water Alliance study that was recently completed on preventing shutoffs for water customers. Uh, it is a lot of data, uh, but I'll only highlight the key elements uh, that shaped our understanding of challenges customers are facing and our near and long-term priorities and focus areas to address them. So the ability for customers to manage their water and power bills was significantly disrupted by the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, our overall residential water and power arrears were at approximately $85 million. This was down from about 150 million right after the billing system issues occurred. However, this was still roughly 50% higher than before the new system was put in. With the pandemic, these arrears jumped to over $380 million in December 2021, and then dropped to 170 million after a number of bill relief efforts were applied in the early part of this year. However, these have now climbed back to over 225 million, which highlights that customers need further assistance and support. The bill relief funds that, were, that we were able to get from the state earlier this year were a tremendous help for customers. These totaled over $330 million for water, electric, and sewer bills, and were primarily applied to nearly 300,000 residential accounts. These were through the um, California Arrearage Payment Program, or CAP, and the California Water and Wastewater Arrearage uh, Payment Program, or is called the CWAP. The, the state relief along with other relief efforts were significant. However, they didn't address the longstanding disparity in arrears density across the communities that we serve. Before the pandemic, areas such as South Los Angeles and Harbor had 20 to 30% of residents in arrears, and this continued post state relief. This highlights that a number of communities have had and continue to have significant need for assistance. Approximately 75% of low-income customers were historically able to stay current with their, low, with their water and power bills, but with the pandemic, this dropped to about 65%. And Lifeline customers, customers who are low-income and older than 62, remained at about 80%. So there is a baseline with this customer segment that is able to manage water and power bills, but there are 20 to 35% who need further assistance. Even though this segment represents approximately 15% of all residential customers, they do represent a smaller portion in terms of energy and water consumption. So approximately 10% on the water side, on the power side, and 5% on the water, on the water side. So this is the water side, which is, is a lower 
ratio than the power, uh, primarily due to most multifamily water services are master metered and billed to, uh, to the landlord. So in understanding that our customers need further support and that we need to update our services and programs, we have focused our areas in three main, we have focused our efforts in three main areas. Additional relief, affordability programs, and support and accessibility. And I'll review these focus areas in the next few slides. So in addition to the CAP and the CWAP programs, we have worked with state, local community organizations and other third parties to facilitate further relief funds to customers. To date, this has totaled nearly $120 million. This was primarily through the CARES Utility Grant Program that we implemented early in the pandemic, the Housing is Key State Program, and the low-income household energy and water assistance programs, which this year can provide up to $3,000 for power bills and $2,000 for water bills. With our outreach and engagement efforts, which Joe will discuss later, we're trying to get LIHEAP and LIWAP um, applications to significantly increase. We, we launched the Customer Connection Survey program early this year to better understand our customers. Over 50,000 of the targeted 95,000 customers participated and received approximately $7.5 million in bill credits. We are looking to continue these research efforts and roll the remaining $7.5 million that we budgeted into a customer research panel focused on low income and lifeline customers. We're also currently working with the information technology and financial service teams to implement further programs that could provide up to another $114 million in customer bill relief. These, these are the items in, works, in, in the works, but we're <clears throat> pursuing further relief funds at the state and federal levels, which Matt will discuss a little bit later. To supplement these relief efforts, we have and are working on programs to further help customers manage their water and power bills. We've streamlined the customer application process for the Easy Save, or formerly known as Life Low Income Discount Program. This led to a 25% improvement in the application acceptance rate and 21,000 new customers being enrolled over the past year. The Level Pay Program launched um, last week to provide customers an ability to have a flat predictable amount that they can pay on a monthly basis. In addition, we're also the first utility to incorporate arrears into level pay, which allows customers to address past bills while also managing future bills. We expect this to be a great help for customers. We have doubled our payment arrangement options for discount customers, providing up to 48 months. We're also working to ad provide additional flexibility and the ability for online signups for these. So we recognize that customer support is strongly dependent on customer access to available programs and services. This involves awareness of programs that are specifically applicable to them and awareness through languages, entities, and channels that they feel comfortable with. One of the challenges that we've identified is that customers are often getting information piecemeal, whether based on our outreach focus or based on inquiry focus. So in January this year, we piloted the customer consultations program to conduct one-on-one -on -one assessment of customer needs, identifying applicable programs and walking them through the enrollment process. We schedule these sessions with customer we schedule these sessions with customers, we, and we do our account research ahead of time and prepare for the session, and then spend about an hour to an hour and a half uh, with each of these customers. The pilot was a limited test of the service, but based on the positive customer feedback and participation, we are now working on expanding the service with initial focus on low-income customers, and then expanding to all residential customers, and then eventually to small and micro businesses. We, uh, we just completed an RFP process to establish four pilot grants for community outreach and disadvantaged communities through the deployment of community outreach workers. We anticipate this will greatly help us in testing out new customer engagement channels and getting customer feedback. This was also recommended in the U.S. Water Alliance shutoff prevention study. Um, we also established MOUs with the CBOs who administered the LIHEAP and LIWAP uh, programs to share customer data to facilitate enrollment in these relief programs where we see there's a lot of potential to be able to directly help customers. We are currently working on a number of additional initiatives to improve customer support and accessibility. A really important one is customer segmentation and predictive analytics. Uh, this is critical for us to better understand our customers and their needs. 
to better to best align our support efforts and services with each of these segments and to be proactive with our customer engagement rather than being just responsive. We just completed an RFP to get assistance with defining the segmentation strategy and the implementation approach. And it was scheduled to be at this meeting, but we will be bringing it back at the, uh, hopefully at the next meeting uh, for approval. We're releasing an RFP on October 5th to replace our customer contact center platform, which will facilitate customer engagement through the contact center and provide our team members with a full view <coughs> of the customer and allow them to be more responsive and helpful to our customers. And it also facilitate our segmentation alignment efforts. What is that exactly? Is that, so when a call comes in to the customer contact center, it's the database that the, the uh, employee is working? Uh, so, yeah, can you just explain? Sure, uh, there's a couple of components. Uh, so one is the automated call tree, like you know when you call, and it helps route and identify. And there's some self-service capabilities. Um, and we're not gonna try to force people into that. Um, but then also routing it to the agent who has the best skill set that can support them um, is are the primary components. Then there's another one, which is the database, as you mentioned, that our customers will be dealing with and uh, being able to view and access customer information uh, rather than toggling between five, uh, actually like 10 or 12 different ones. Uh, they'd be able to access all that information through one, which is then pulling the information in the background. Okay, to them. That's very helpful. Um, given the other discussions you and I are having, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love at some point once that's implemented to actually take a look at it. Yes. Uh, we'll so get just that keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, <clears throat> um, a key part of our customer engagement efforts is our 14 service centers that we have throughout the cities and in key communities that have the higher densities of customers in arrears. We've been investing to upgrade these centers to make them more conducive for customer engagement and support. We're currently working with our labor partners to fully reopen the center for walk-ins and ensuring any safety concerns that our team or customers may have are addressed. Customer service is also establishing an accessibility team that will be in place by the end of this year and be focused on identifying and addressing barriers and issues that customers face while engaging with us using our services or participate in available programs. We're also expanding our customer research efforts and establishing a customer panel specific to low income customers and those in disadvantaged communities, which will further help us in understanding their needs and to get their feedback on current and future programs and services. And lastly, we are expanding uh, language support across all customer touch points. <clears throat> so these efforts uh, and others are key to the LADWP's near-term and long-term commitments. These commitments involve a number of factors and considerations such as equity center research and the rate structures. For today or for this portion of the discussion, we'll, we'll focus on the revenue management considerations and share some data and insight on collections. So we have not collected any, we have not conducted any collection activities or specifically any shutoffs since March, 2020. Um, however, looking at the three years prior, 77,000 77, residential customers were shut off for non-payment, over 50,000 for power, nearly 12 for water and another 12,000 or so for water and power. Of these accounts, nearly 40% were shut off more than once. For the same period, Comparing us to other nearby large utilities, our, our shutoff rate of 2.7% was at the bottom of the range, with only SoCal gas being lower at a little less than 2%. However, we were far less than SCE, uh, who was around 9%, and PG&E, who was around 4 to 5%. So even though our sh shutoff rates are historically lower, we are striving to make shutoffs the very last resort uh, and trying to minimize their impact by increasing engagement and support. So the CPUC published a study in 2019 which highlighted the correlation of disconnections with certain demographic and socioeconomic factors such as low-income households and Latino and black residents. Looking at these elements, we looked at our own data in our service territory to identify where we need to focus our support and engagement efforts. From a median income view, we're seeing the lowest income households making less than $50,000 annually are nearly twice more likely to be shut off than those households making over $100,000. 
from an ethnicity or race perspective, communities that are primarily black or African American saw shut off rates of 8% and Hispanic communities saw nearly 7%. This was in comparison to other communities that ranged from five to three to three and a half percent. In addition to the number of shutoffs, it's important to also look at the duration of the shutoffs. This is it's pretty granular, but a couple of key points. Overall, almost half were able to restore their service within a day but a third took more than a day. And about a quarter or 23% restored within three days, but there were also 4% who took longer than two months. And there were about 20% who did not try to restore and just abandoned service. Do you know what the, pop the number is, the total, the, pop the, the population set that this is of? Uh, so this is, this is based on the 77,000 that, 77. uh, that were the sh residential shutoffs that were done during that period. So now looking at these at the community level, we do see that disadvantaged communities based on the Cal Enviro screening where the higher the score, the more disadvantaged the community. Based on the shutoffs in 2017 to 2020, the highest values correlated to restoration times of nearly a full day. Looking at this from a household income view, those in the communities predominantly making less than 50,000 had restoration times that were nearly three times those making over $50,000 from 22 hours to you know around seven to eight. We also saw that predominantly black, Hispanic and Asian communities had three to four times longer shutoff periods than other areas. So another finding that we feel is important to look at is that that of the nearly 50,000 customers who were shut off, uh, looking at a shorter period than before, 2018 to 2019, only 1,700 had taken advantage of no or low cost efficiency programs. And only about a quarter or less signed up for some payment plan or gotten any light heap relief that was available. So this isn't a full snapshot, um, and, but it is strongly indicative that engagement levels were low with customers who were struggling to pay their bills. Um, please note that this doesn't mean to imply that any of these alone would have prevented shutoff. However, they would definitely help in the short and long term uh, to, to better manage them. So building up customer engagement with these customers is critical. Since the end of the moratorium six months ago, we have not, we have not shut off any customers, um, but we've been focusing on addressing these customer impacts and helping our most vulnerable customers to manage past bills and carefully constructing programs, tools, and mechanisms that can immediately and tangibly help them to manage future bills. In addition to those we've managed, we mentioned earlier, there are a number of immediate policy and process changes that we're implementing to facilitate restorations and minimize the impacts of, of shutoffs. These are based on the data analysis, the feedback that we've received from customers directly and community partners and seen in studies such as the US Waterline study. We historically suspended shutoffs when temperatures rose uh, higher than 100 degrees. However, we're, we're gonna align it better to, um, with the excessive heat warnings and have it based on those rather than just uh, 100 degrees. This will minimize any health impacts uh, that may occur. We're also suspending reconnection fees and shutoffs on Fridays. Um, based on the duration times that are potential uh, for restoration, we wanna make sure customers have time and not have any extended uh, outages. And accepting partial payments or pledges to restore service. Previously, we allowed partial payments to avoid shutoff, but once we were on site or had completed the shutoff, we required full payment. Um, <clears throat> we're also applying the multi-language uh, notification requirements for water service shutoffs to all services, which will help in increasing engagement. To ensure that shutoffs are the last resort, we're also ramping up outreach and engagement efforts through the bill cycle. Um, we're continuing to develop targeted communications directly and through partner organizations to increase awareness of programs, and then being proactive with customers who are past due to drive engagement and identify the best option for them. And lastly, implementing changes to minimize restoration periods. Since the moratorium ended on April 1st, we have not conducted any, I'm sorry, um, we haven't conducted any shutoffs, but we did initiate a gradual ramp up of collections. From April till now, we have conducted a number of outreach campaigns to ensure customers are aware that the moratorium has ended. We've, pa <coughs> we've, we've put in uh, past due notices 
back into, um, and then we've replaced the payment, which replaced the payment reminders that were used during the moratorium. Next, we're looking at three phases to gradually start collections with large and commercial industrial customers, and then eventually residential and low income residential next year. So with communication and effort, <coughs> outreach efforts starting in April and with engagement efforts underway with our key accounts team, collections will start for large commercial and industrial segments in November with a gradual phase in of the other segments leading to residential collections starting in around April of next year. For discount residential, <coughs> collections will start in May 2023. However, we do understand and recognize that these customers need additional time to address their, long, their bills long-term. And we're also pursuing additional relief funds for these customers that may take some time to get. So as we work with these customers and help them through this, we'll defer collection activities through September 2023. So for now, customers when you who say sign collection up collection activities, is that a euphemism for moratoriums or is that just collection activities short of I mean that moratorium shutoffs, or is that collection activities short of shutoffs? Uh, collection activities short of shutoffs. Okay. So we would still send reminders. Um, for customers who sign up for a payment arrangement or level pay, uh, received a LIHEAP or LIWAP pledge or participate in customer consultation since the end of the moratorium, uh, April 1st, 2022, collections will be deferred through September, 2023. The key to, <clears throat> the key to ensure that this is helping customers who need this support will be further ramping up outreach and engagement across all channels. And as we do this and pursue additional relief, we'll then continually reassess. Um, I'll turn it over to Matt now to provide an update on the legislative efforts. Uh, thank you, George. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Is that better? Okay. Um, so I uh, have a number of updates as to what's transpired uh, so far to address the uh, concerns about arrearages for our customers. Um, in the 2021 state budget, thanks to a coalition of utilities that came together to make this a priority for the legislature, uh, the CAP and the CWAP programs were uh, initiated, um, which used uh, federal funds that the state had received uh, to wipe away customer utility debts that had been accrued from March 2020 through June of 2021. Um, and then uh, at the federal level in 2021, the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, created the LIWAP program based, to, uh, based on the LIHEAP uh, program, uh, which covers uh, federally funded uh, supplements to cover the cost of, of uh, water bills as LIHEAP does for power bills. Um, but it does require ratepayers to apply for relief through CBOs. Um, and then in uh, this year's state budget, the CAP program was extended to include debts from June of 2021 through December 2021, and the legislature added another $1.2 billion uh, to the program to cover the costs of that expansion. Um, we, in uh, the last month, uh, tried with our partners, uh, particularly led uh, by SFPUC, to have the CWAP program uh, similarly modified using existing funds that remain at the water board uh, to cover the June to December 2021 debts. Ultimately, uh, the legislature uh, in the end of session chose not to make any changes to the program, but that money still remains at the state water board. So there's still $300 million of potential relief funding available to us, which brings us to our next steps, um, which will be uh, to try to get to uh, uh, get the legislature to adopt it, CWAP um, 2.0 uh, to cover those June 21, 2021 to December 2021 20, debts. Um, we prefer the CWAP program for a number of reasons. Um, this is a win-win-win for our red bears and for us. It does not require customers to apply for relief, so they don't have to go and find a CBO, fill out applications. Uh, their debts are just covered by uh, our data being sent up to the State Water uh, Resources Control Board, and they cut us a check, um, an actual physical check in the case of the Water Resources Control Board. Um, the, that erases the debts from our books and it erases the debts from our customers' books, and it forestalls shutoffs and uh, future rate increases because um, one of the things that we're looking at on the legislative team is what's going to drive rate uh, adjustments moving forward, and we're trying to get ahead of those by uh, reducing the utilities costs uh, wherever we can find aid uh, from other government agencies. Um, and then in addition to CWAP 2.0, we're going to be pursuing direct subsidies for low-income ratepayers in the form of funding from other government agencies. Um, we're in a period where 
both the state and the federal government are uh, providing more funding for local government than they ever have. Um, and we are trying to position ourselves to take uh, well advantage of that largesse. Um, and particularly on uh, helping our low income rate payers because we know that they're all trying to dig themselves out of a hole. The more that we can uh, offer them on the front end so that they don't accrue debts to begin with, uh, the better off we will all be and the better off we will uh, be for rate growth. Um, this is not an exhaustive list either. Uh, these are, uh, we're in the middle of engaging both the power and water systems on developing a more robust uh, set of legislative proposals for the next year. Um, so these are the ones that we know we're going to be pursuing on uh, customer debt and customer uh, um, affordability for our services. Uh, well, Joe's coming up, I'll simply add the following. Um, we know that our legislative agenda is pretty much controlled by the city council. We don't have an independent agenda, independent of the city of LA. So it's going to be critically important from my perspective that we continue to cause our friends at the council to appreciate the relationship between debt burden and utility debt um, and um, LA 100, a, a topic that is, you know, referenced quite a lot, um, but without addressing in a very meaningful way debt burden, um, LA 100 simply will not pencil. I mean, there are a lot of challenges uh, to LA 100, but uh, not the least of which is our customers' ability to actually you know, pay their utility bills. And to the extent that debt burden increases um, and becomes more unaffordable, uh, that will create, in my view, a backlash that threatens to undermine many of our other more grandiose and, um, you know, uh, more heavily promoted goals. So um, I would say that it is, uh, it would behoove the department to take the lead in driving that message um, and working with many of our uh, community-based partners uh, to cause people to appreciate how critical that uh, this component is to, um, to energy and water equity. Yeah, we, we did, uh, we were able to get a resolution through council um, covering this legislative session for any uh, relief. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, um, we'll pursue that uh, for the next later legislative session, as well as um, looking at what else we might add into that to ensure that it covers uh, everything that we could um, pursue at both the state and federal level. Thank you. And, and so I do have a question before we move on to communication, because as when you start your presentation, we all know that it's not just water and power on the bill, it's it's um, trash and sewer. And so I just want to know how is all this integrated and how does it all work together? Because obviously we have no control over the trash and the sewer, but it's on our bill. So are wanting to make sure that we're all working together as a city family to to make sure everybody's on the same page. And so how does that work? Um, we, we do work with, uh, we are actively working with LA SAN um, from normal operations of the billing and, and the integration of their services and service charges on our bills um, and uh, our planning efforts. Uh, we're currently working with them. Uh, we just finished the application of the CWAP uh, sewer funds uh, or wastewater funds uh, for that. We're working with them on some additional funds that the council is sponsoring for addressing trash uh, arrears. Um, but then also as we're d developing these programs, some of the engagement efforts, you know, they engage with the same customers. So we're in, they can also access the same program. So we're, we're sharing information there, trying to make sure that we're consistent and, um, and referring customers to these programs. Um, and then with the prioritization of these, uh, those we do factor the, in the um, sewer and the trash uh, charges into how we, um, which customers we're, we're prioritizing um, based on thresholds and so on. Um, so, yes. And the reason I'm asking this question, because when I look at my individual bill, my sanitation side is higher than my water and power. So yes. I just want to make sure that we are looking at this holistically. And when we're talking about giving you know, debt relief to our customers that it's done holistically. Yes, definitely. 
Yeah, and there, uh, as uh, Matt mentioned, there's there continues to be some funding available uh, for, through the State Water Resources Control Board for for the uh, CWAP program, which does cover both water and wastewater. Uh, so we. Uh, when we uh, when we are pursuing that next year to try to see if we can get some um, some additional uh, coverage there, I think we will make sure that it includes wastewater as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I wanted to provide you with a brief overview of the communications and outreach activities around um, three different aspects uh, that you've heard today from George, uh, specifically around the Easy Safe campaign. And I'll switch the slide here to the details that you'll see. Um, we began a campaign in November of 21 um, through March of 22 uh, to enroll more uh, customers in our low income and lifeline programs. This was um, targeted to disadvantaged communities and multilingual, um, and it, it was coupled together with the streamlined application process um, that George uh, mentioned as well. In addition to that, with the state assistance from the federal government on the way, um, we ramped up a, another awareness campaign to make sure our customers knew of the assistance that was coming. Um, that was called Help is on the Way, and you'll see that time frame there. That time frame actually extended because it included then the sewage um, uh, arrears uh, credits that were then applied. So there was actually a pause, and then we continued to ensure that customers knew that their bills that had accumulated were going to be uh, in many cases, significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. um, that campaign uh, was underway, and then we transitioned it after that in anticipation of the potential for uh, resuming collections activities and transitioning to late bills uh, to the We're Here to Help campaign, which is basically contact us if you're behind, enroll in an extended repayment plan. It was really built around promoting our extended repayment plan. So we went from um, this overarching easy safe campaign that had uh, enroll in our discount programs, low income and lifeline, to this financial assistance coming, to now that that financial assistance has been applied, we have payment plans that are gonna help you spread this out over uh, multiple years in the case of those program participants. Um, again, the focus here was on low-income and disadvantaged communities um, advertising. It was a multimedia campaign, a multilingual, um, in English, Spanish, Tagalog, uh, Vietnamese, Mandarin, Armenian, and Farsi. Um, I previously shared with you the full campaign, so I'm not gonna go into the details of all of those tactics today, but just to share with you a couple of the uh, visual and creative that were used for that, including on our website. Uh, the total campaign for this was just under $300,000. Um, again, targeting uh, customers in, in communities where we knew there was a high incidence of customers who'd fallen behind on their bills. Um, again, just to summarize, those tactics include um, Earn Media, which we were very pleased to do and get a significant coverage on when we launched these and throughout um, radio, uh, print, and direct mailers. Um, we, we mailed postcards to our customers uh, for, uh, for the help is on the way. Every customer that was going to receive a credit, receive notification that that was uh, coming and going to be applied to their bills. Um, it was digital, social, outdoor, um, and then um, additional um, webinars and other things with community and uh, city family um, departments and staff, uh, along with council staff. Just to give you an idea of the performance of the campaigns, um, they were visible, they were very well received. I think, um, I, I'll get to in a moment, I think what we can do in addition to what has been done already, um, <coughs> just to see the emails. Um, again, just wanna note our percentage open rate is extraordinary uh, when compared to what the industry average is for emails. Typically you'll get a 3% open rate uh, in the market, we get 45%. So customers read our emails when they That's get from us. That's very good. We've significantly upped our direct email in support of all of our uh, initiatives, including Cool LA as an example. Uh, community newspaper ads and radio, um, transit ads, uh, digital uh, billboards, uh, and social media, um, almost nine million impressions on social media. In terms of what's, what we're focusing on right now that is pertinent to the discussion, um, uh, includes the Cool LA campaign, which is especially beneficial to those customers enrolled in low income and lifeline. As you know, that's a $250 rebate for those customers. Um, that effort, um, together with the um, low income household um, water and energy assistance programs, um, that'll be a $400,000 effort uh, in terms of advertising that's ramping up right now at, um, as we speak. I did wanna mention that um, the Easy Pay program, one of the challenges is that during the, the pandemic, a lot of folks, for one reason or another, were no longer enrolled in low income and lifeline. I think you've seen those stats. And so through 
this period of time that we focused on additional outreach and, and awareness, we've actually added 30,000. Um, the low was 113,000 participants in May of 2020. Um, and as of September 1st, we had 143,535. So there's been a significant result, but the problem has been we've been climbing back from that low that we experienced during the pandemic. Um, and so the goal really is to extend beyond uh, the, the level that we've reached uh, in September uh, through additional efforts. I do want to note as well that in November when we launched the awareness um, campaign, all the earned media and the beginning of ads, uh, we actually had the highest monthly enrollment for low income, and that was 8,000 new enrollees that month. Um, the previous low had been experienced in July of 21 of 2,900 enrollees. So the advertising and awareness works. It works to a point, and it works for only for so long because there will be some message fatigue there. That's why it's important to run campaigns and to let them sunset for a little bit and then ramp them back up. Uh, in the case of Cool LA um, and what's coming next, Cool LA um, on the website and in our advertising, we're making it clear that you need to be a low income and lifeline participant um, to receive the benefit. And on the website, you can actually click there to take you to enroll in the program. So there's some cross um, benefit there to the low income easy save program. Uh, by participating and by through our advertising for Cool LA. Uh, what I would recommend is that we continue and do a more significant buy on paid advertising around Easy Save specifically. We were in a period of time where we wanted to focus on Easy Save and getting enrollments, but we also had a lot to communicate about these credits that were coming to our customers, um, and then that they, we wanted them to enroll in extended payment plans. So if we want to focus just on low income. We can run that campaign more heavily, spe spe specify and figure out exactly the timing for that, and put more money behind it that will help drive those numbers even higher. One of the challenges, as you know, is the low income um, discount is not that significant. But one of the things we want to highlight now is that that program allows you to be eligible for more of our programs that can help you, mm -hmm. like Cool LA. Um, the other one would be improving our direct customer targeting uh, through direct mail and direct contact. Um, I think you know one of the, that's one of the challenges, and some of the a lot of the IT improvements that are going to happen in customer service will allow us to do a lot more segmenting of our customers um, to target them with the programs that they need. We do that now, but um, it would be a lot. It, it will be more robust, more effective, uh, with a better customer uh, information system that we can draw from, um, and then also just the collaboration with CBOs, um, helping them build capacity to help extend our outreach. Um, I know that's part of the CBO grant program that, that George mentioned, um, but we're happy to support. We just have, we develop toolkits around our communications materials for each of these campaigns that can be shared with CBOs and have been shared with CBOs through George and his team, um, shared with city council staff as well. Um, we just want to keep um, in putting that effort behind each of these um, as we go in order to see the results. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions around the outreach and advertising if you'd like. Uh, are there any questions? Um, I, I just have a couple of observations. I think um, that um, that we do a very effective job of building campaigns, but it's really clear um, both uh, by virtue of the people that we hear from and some of the work that's done in communities that um, when you start to get to low income residents, you know, we're not necessarily penetrating. And all of the programs in the world don't matter if the people for whom they are being developed and designed don't know about them. So I think we're going to have to take a much more um, critical look at, um, at the results that we're getting and how we are actually reaching um, individuals. I also believe that we are going to need to uh, rethink how we work with CBOs. Um, right now, they're touching the department all over the department. It continues to be, and, and the department doesn't talk to each other. <laughs> so, you know, you've got whatever's happening in customer service, whatever's happening in equity strategies, whatever's happening in, um, in our uh, resiliency space, uh, and then you know, what may be happening uh, at some point uh, in DE&I. And we've got to really, you know, as a department, determine how we're going to um, center 
our engagement with CBOs and what the return is on that investment because it's hugely problematic. Um, you know, for the people on the ground that are talking to our customers most intensely to not have a good sense of what is available and how to navigate um, our various systems. I continue to be, as you know, um, um, interested in seeing a significant change in our website, um, Mark, um, because, and George, um, because every single time we do something, and Cool LA is a good example, it you know that becomes the point at which we drop the ball because we don't have an easy place to refer people, and we have lots of different workarounds. And one page may be simple to navigate, and then it's going to take you to something else that isn't quite as simple or efficient. Um, Again, we can do all this other work, but if we make it difficult for people to access or walk through or get to what they need to get through, um, that just defeats the purpose. Um, we need to very, very significantly increase our outreach around level pay and around easy save for the reasons, Joe, that you, that you mentioned. I'd be interested in understanding um, what the rate of return is on radio, what the rate of return is on um, on cable TV. I know they do a lot of, you know, that's a much uh, less expensive buy um, and may be a good supplement to some of the print work that we're doing, but it really is how do we make sure that the customers that we are most interested in targeting are being targeted. Um, so that's sort of my feedback on on that piece of the presentation. Uh, in terms of the overall uh, issue of, of a debt burden. I do have a, co a question. Um, there was a slide that came up and we went through rather quickly. Um, and this goes to uh, to Greg regarding mm -hmm. the overall uh, debt burden by income. You had a slide you basically that looked at the entire city of LA and you basically said that, you know, we could spend a lot of time on this slide, but increasingly or that it's just generally true that utility debt burden weighs most heavily on the poor. Can you just tell me a little bit more about um, that by percentage of income, or do you have any additional details around utility debt burden that you can discuss right now? Uh, sure. I, I guess to be clear, referring to the residential yes. customers yes. only? Yes. Residential customers. Um, and what I meant by that I think you're going to have to go to the mic so that... Thank you. So what I meant by that was a specifically a focus where studies are done on, on residential customers of utilities. Um, and there, I, I mean, I, I guess I can't name every study I've seen, and there's at least a dozen studies I've seen in, in different contexts outside of LA shows um, low-income customers, I mean, variously defined, but usually using a standard threshold, like 100% of the federal poverty level, 200% of the federal poverty level, 150% that re relate to eligibility for discount programs, are more likely to carry higher debt burdens, despite having low, I mean, consuming less than higher-income customers, and also that Again, even when you do sort of complicated statistical regression analysis, um, that households of color tend to carry more debt even after accounting for income. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I'll be interested in your additional work uh, during equity strategies. I'm very interested in um, both the debt burden related questions um, and um, also uh, very much in um, the other issue that you touched upon related to the revenue side and the degree to which um, those households account for both utilization of utility services and also the revenue that's generated by that utility. Um, 
by that by that utilization of utility services because I think it does factor very directly into the cost versus benefits of uh, shutoffs as a as a means of uh, ensuring payment for utility services. So I'm very interested in those issues and we'll be checking in on that work. Are there other questions? I have perhaps a question. Ten, a question. Uh, um, m many of the pe uh, people who were, you know, uh, testifying today talked about how they had to go to the park as if that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there seem to be a lot of parks to go to. The question is, how mu how much better could we do in, in in those parks and schools? Which is, there's a big vote today about greening schools and how are we engaged? And so I don't know that there's an answer here, but um, I know that that the school, that the parks tried really hard over this, this you know, during the pandemic to service the community in as best as they could. And it would be great. And, and also there's now cooling centers that are, you know, sort of getting built and built up whether it's in um, separate buildings or otherwise. So to a degree, um, that sense of community that can happen, the support that you can get when you are in a cooling center or in a park is something that is important to value. So, you know, I don't know what the cost, you know, who pay, you know, how, how, the park system pays for their bill, for their bills. Uh, how you know the county and the city park system, the libraries, but I'm just hoping that that all of that gets you know balanced, obviously with debt relief and you know basically the basic and important needs of of the residents of the city of Los Angeles, getting you know uh, being able to, to stay cool and get water and debt relief. But just uh, curious, because I know they that those 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 public places um, have borne a bur burden and need to be attended to also. So, so we've had for uh, at least a dozen years uh, MOU with uh, with LAUSD on mm -hmm. uh, energy efficiency and water conservation for the schools. Um, so we've committed a significant amount of funding um, and activity uh, around improving the, um, both improving the, the comfort level in schools as well as helping uh, helping the school system save money on their uh, on their energy and water bills. Uh, similarly with Rec and Parks, we work closely with them um, on their, uh, particularly on community centers, uh, uh, recreation centers, um, yeah. on uh, providing you know them as much assistance as we can around energy efficiency and water conservation again for comfort and for uh, you know helping them save money on their bills. Um, we 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 don't and and can't as I understand it offer them a special rate for government facilities that uh, kind of went by the wayside with uh, some of the um, uh, restrictions that exist on our rates. Um. So thank you for that. I do want to uh, underscore and one of the things that I'm uh, uh, a little sad about, but happy for next year is that we had a late bowl out of Cool LA um, because we want fewer of our residents to have to flee their homes um, in order to mm -hmm. deal with the uh, extreme temperatures. And I'm very proud of the department for having stepped up. Uh, with the Cool LA initiative in order to facilitate that. Um, Nancy, thank you for mentioning uh, you know, certain limitations based on um, legal and other constraints related to rates. Uh, I know that we are actively looking at um, a rate case and um, we'll continue to be talking to uh, other policymakers about the need to gain some relief <laughs> from uh, rate constraints because um, as was noted here today, among the tools that needs to be in the tool belt is uh, the flexibility to engage in rate design. Um, that would also achieve greater, um, uh, you know, a greater and fairer, more equitable distribution of payment 
for uh, the services that we provide. That's not something that this board controls, um, but something again that the department has got to take an increasingly, um, an increasing role in advocating for because it is the only way that we're gonna get uh, through uh, where we, from where we are to where we wanna be um, in a way that promotes and provides for equity. Um, if there are, are there any additional questions in the context of this workshop? Uh, if not, then um, my final observations are as follows. I know that, uh, that we've not shut off anyone and I would be loath to see that occurring, um, certainly uh, with respect to our low income and our lifeline customers. Uh, we've got an awful lot to do as it relates to engagement and building out the systems of support mm -hmm. that will allow us to ensure that we are able to provide services and that our customers are able to avail themselves of those services and maintain their, um, you know, their economic uh, viability. So uh, I'm encouraged that so much is underway. I really, really appreciate the clarity with which you've laid out the path forward. I think the department has, has, has been thinking deeply about these issues. Um, it is important that our community know that, uh, that we remain here for them and that we will work with them uh, to ensure that we are together building a stronger LA and whether that is working with um, low income housing providers um, in order to ensure their ability to continue to do what they do uh, or working with just a scared mom in um, San Pedro. And it doesn't matter that we've not shut anybody off. If you're afraid that that could happen to you, that anxiety is palpable. And we need to be really, really mindful um, of people's experience. Um, and if you come from a place where you've experienced that or you know someone has experienced that, you know, we're a long way away from that place and they have no idea um, what we do or say in this room. So we've got to get a whole lot better about providing a level of security uh, to folks that, um, you know, that they can count on being able to turn the lights on and that water will continue to flow from the taps. I appreciate everybody's work here today. And with that, this workshop is closed. And we will go back to our regular agenda. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Good job. Oh, I'm sorry. We've got one more presentation. Um, we are closing our presentation uh, with a presentation from uh, Gloria Medina, <coughs> Tiffany Wong, Alicia Morales Perez, and Gloria Salinas. Uh, I got so carried away listening to folks in public comment that I forgot that we actually have a formal representation uh, from a CBO. I know that it's gotten a little late, so if we could uh, go through this final item. David, are they here? Okay, thank patience. you ladies, I'm sorry. Just trying to figure out the, the layout. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had this drafted as good morning, but it's now good afternoon. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, commissioners and members of the public. My name is Alicia Morales Perez, Senior Research and Policy Analyst with Lane. And I am here uh, in this presentation with my colleague, Tiffany Wong, who's also a research associate with SCOPE and Gloria Salinas who is a community member, a South LA resident, small business owner, and member of SCOPE as well. In closing out today's presentation, uh, we appreciate you for focusing on the, the topic of utility debt, of shutoffs, and ultimately affordability, especially for low-income ratepayers. 
We are here today with our community members, not just in these chambers, but in, in the overflow rooms to shine light on the real life impacts of shutoffs on Angelinos. As we saw today, thousands of Angelinos were affected in shutoffs prior to the pandemic, accumulating high levels of debt. And as we saw in the presentation, 80, over $85 million, forcing many of them into trade-offs in order to pay their bills and ultimately putting them in dangerous positions, choosing between shelter, utilities, food, transportation, and more. We also know from the pandemic that when our members were able to pay their bills, they did. In a city where the cost of living is, is constantly increasing, especially low income pairs are finding it harder to keep the water running and the lights on. Especially as we continue to recover from the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic, addressing the impact of shutoffs is an important issue to our members. And these are solutions that we've been looking forward to for a long time. As part of the Repower LA Coalition, we've been fighting for affordable utilities, equitable programs, and pathways to union jobs for many years. We commend the work of this board and of the utility to provide utility debt relief in the tens of millions of dollars to thousands of Evangelinos over the last two years. And of course, enacting a shutoff moratoria that began in April of 2020 and sunset earlier this year. But the work cannot end there. While LADWP and the city of LA identified pathways on how to keep rates affordable and sustainable through the work of LA 100 uh, equity strategies, frontline communities need to have protections now. It was kind of jarring to see that there might be shutoffs happening in, in September of 2023 and for all residential customers even earlier. Especially as climate change continues to affect our city, as we recently experienced over a week long heat wave, and as the city proactively moves to a clean and renewable energy economy, we need to ensure there are baseline and safety nets for low income rate payers in, in the city. As we heard today, race and income are strong indicators of who gets their utilities shut off and for how long they are disconnected. We also learned that prior to the moratoria, many were living without access and water and power, even as our climate impacts worsen. We also learned that oft, too often repairs are getting disconnected more than once. I believe we heard that of, of folks who were disconnected, 40% were getting disconnected again or not getting reconnected at all. For those reasons, we are asking DWP to enact a policy, a policy to stop water and power shutoffs for low income residential customers to protect communities from the inhumane, life threatening situations of living without water and power. The shutoff moratoria saved lives. The next best step is to implement a permanent solution to shutoffs. And we will share some of those recommendations with you today. I will now pass it to my colleague, Tiffany Wong, to speak on some specific policy recommendations. Well, thank you, Alicia, for setting the stage on. <laughs> thank you, Alicia, for setting the stage on, on why we're here and our demands. Much of DWP's data analysis and our recommendations shared today come out of the preventing shutoffs pilot convened by the US Water Alliance and done in partnership with SCOPE. And today's presentation is a snapshot of the existing analysis that shows how much shutoffs are a racial justice issue and the immense onus on LADWP to right these inequities. We continue to push for LADWP to, to make this data analysis public and commit to implementing the full slate of recommendations from this effort. Thus, on behalf of the Repower LA Coalition and the frontline communities we represent, we are demanding an end to water and power shutoffs for all low income residential customers. While past relief has focused on customers on discount programs, we are urging a broad safety net that covers many who still face systemic barriers accessing these programs, supports cross enrollment with those on other public assistance programs and includes those making 50% um, area me medium income or less. This no shutoffs policy should be extended to all customers during extreme weather. So no Angelino goes without water and power during cold snaps or worsening heat storms. 
We also want to see greater shutoff protections for small commercial customers and communities on the front lines of pollution and poverty in recognition of the compounding health, environmental, and socioeconomic impacts that communities like South LA, North Seas Valley, and Wilmington, San Pedro communities continue to face. Stopping shutoffs is a critical measure for protecting public health and ensuring accountability. But without further action, our most vulnerable communities will continue to struggle. This no shutoffs policy must be tied with efforts to provide utility debt relief, enact affordability measures, pursue equitable decarbonization, improve customer service and outreach, and increase access to DWP career pathways. We, we recognize that there are still many questions about what a future without shutoffs looks like and how we get there. But we wanna start with making sure that LADWP is working with us and impacted community members on this needed visioning and policy change. At the end of the day, yes, there's data and evidence, but more importantly, this is really about people. I want you to recall many of the stories that were shared during public comment and, and understand that these reflect many others unheard stories across our city. And to close, we want to again center the voices of our community members. Um, so I want, it's with deep appreciation that I invite Gloria Salinas, a South LA resident, small business owner and grassroots leader to share her testimony with you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gloria Salinas. Soy líder de Scope. My name is Gloria Salinas. I'm a leader of Scope. Soy residente del sur de Los Angeles. And I'm a resident of South LA. Dueña de un pequeño negocio. I'm the owner of a small business. Y por mucho tiempo he sido cliente del departamento de luz y, y agua. And I've been a customer of LADWP for a long time. Uh, represento a, a, la, a las personas de bajos ingresos que estamos aquí y las que no están aquí que no pudieron venir también. And I'm representing those who have low income that are here and those who are not here because they couldn't come today. Les doy las gracias por enfocar esta discusión en las en las deudas uh, y las desconexiones del servicio público. Esperamos que se pueda lograr mucho. Uh, I want to say thank you for uh, focusing on the shadows and in the depths, and it is my wish that we can do a lot. Uh, nuestra comunidad como parte de la coalición de Repower, hemos, hemos, perdón, hemos estado luchando mucho por los servicios públicos accesibles. In our community, we've been uh, struggling and advocating for the, um, the, the utilities and the affordability. Para programas más equitativos y caminos hacia trabajos uh, sindicales durante muchos años. If for programs more, there are more equitative and uh, for unions for many years. Y hoy les estamos pidiendo a, al servicio del departamento de Luz y Agua que promulgue una política para detener los cortes de agua y energía. And today we are requesting that you promote a policy to stop the shut-ups of um, energy and, um, and water. Porque nuestras comunidades es inhumano en las situaciones potencialmente mortales de vivir sin agua y energía. Because it is inhuman and potentially deadly to, in, for our communities to live in a situation without water and energy. Uh, les voy a hablar un poco de mi experiencia sobre desconexiones um, y de mis facturas tan altas. Uh -huh. I want to say a little bit about my experience with the shut-offs and with the having to pay bills that they were really high. Uh, siempre he vivido en el sur centro de Los Ángeles y con mucho esfuerzo empecé un pequeño negocio, muy pequeñito. I've, I've always lived in South Los Angeles, and with a lot of effort, I started this little, little, like small, really small business. Es de raspados y helados. 
which is like uh, ice creams and raspados. And I've had this small business for seven years. Pero me ha costado mucho esfuerzo uh, primero hacerlo por, por, por ser regulado con todos los permisos que se requieren. It costs me a lot of effort to, to build it up because there's a lot of regulations and laws to be able to have this kind of business. Ajá. Y, lo, y luego también, a, a después de eso, de, de hacer clientela es muy difícil en, 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 una, en, en nuestra comunidad. Uh -huh. And it is also very difficult in our community to build up the clientele. Me propuse ese reto y me siento orgullosa. So that was my goal, and I, I am proud that I did it. Pero también me siento muy frustrada porque los biles de luz son muy altos. But I also uh -huh. feel very frustrated because the, the energy bills are very high. Um, les voy a hablar de las desconexiones porque esto me ha pasado a mí. And Esa, I want I want to tell you about my own experience with the shadows. Uh, es, es algo muy frustrante. Uh -huh. it, it is very frustrating. Que no me ha pasado ahorita en la pandemia, pero me pasó cuando yo, yo puse mi negocio. Uh, llegaron a, a, a cortarme la luz. Uh -huh. It didn't happen now during the pandemic, but it did happen when I first started my business. They came over to shut off the energy, the electricity. Eh, esta, si, si yo estaba empezando, no tenía para yo poder pagar a la luz. Uh -huh. As I was starting, I didn't have enough to pay the, for the energy, for the electricity. Eh, sen, sentí que era poco el, el pago que tenía que, que hacerse, pero a ese poquito de dinero yo no lo tenía para dar. Uh -huh. it, it, I felt that it was not too much, but even that little money, I didn't have it. Eh, eh, la persona que llegó a cortar la luz, este... Le, le dije que no lo hiciera, que esperara, le, le, jun, le junté 100 dólares para yo poder detener el corte de luz y seguir trabajando. So this person came over and I asked him, please don't do it, and I was able to gather 100 dollars to give this person so they would stop the shut off. Eh, seguí trabajando bien, so haciendo clientela. Eh, eh, soy conocida en mi comunidad. Uh, he juntado muchas firmas para muchos trabajos. He sido una persona activa en las escuelas de mis hijos que ahí mismo en mi comunidad lograron graduarse, que ahora, que ahora están en sus, uh, obteniendo apenas sus profesiones. So I, I, I've always been active in my community. I was able to continue to work and I've always been active, like gathering signatures from community members, helping at the school of my kids where there was any problem. And also now they are starting to graduate. Uh, ahora, ahora por lo que seguiré luchando en, en mi organización de SCOP, que gracias a ellos, este, gracias por las organizaciones que existen para apoyarnos a las comunidades um, de bajos ingresos, para, para, para lograr, lograr muchas cosas que lo han logrado, la verdad, gracias en la pandemia, pero que no se refleja tanto por los viles tan grandes que vienen a nuestra... A, a, a nuestra casa, que, que, que tenemos, queremos tener paz, queremos tener tranquilidad, porque no nada más. So, I will continue now, like, as, um, with this uh, struggle and being active, and I'm really grateful with the community organizations that helps the low-income communities, such as SCOPE, uh, which they, I know that we've done, like, big work, but still it's not reflected because the bills are so high, entonces, eh, yo, yo, les, yo les suplico que, que aparte de, aparte de, de, de tener, de, yo pienso que se trata de conciencia, de cómo, de cómo, de cómo poner, hacer conciencia. ¿Cómo necesitamos nosotros? La luz es una necesidad y no es un privilegio como para, para otro, otro, otras personas que sí pueden pagar que no se les dificulta pagar, pero que yo lo he vivido, es difícil, muy, muy difícil. So I'm like really beg you because um, it is a matter of awareness and conscience. Like there are some people for them, they're not so difficult to, to pay, but I have this experience. We, we live this every day and it is like really hard to pay these bills. Uh, yo voy a seguir este, con mi negocio luchando. Voy a, a seguir uh, involucrada en esta, en esta campaña con mi organización SCOP de mi comunidad, 
para lograr, lograr algo. Yo sé que se va a poder lograr. And I will continue with my business. I will continue with this organization in order to really achieve something. I know that we can do it. Ojalá podamos seguir en conversaciones con ustedes que nos escuchen um, del de, uh, Departamento de Luz y, y Agua. Y muchas gracias por escucharme. And I, and I hope that we can continue this discussion uh, with the Department of Water and Power. And thank you so much for listening. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much. I do want to highlight one of the things that was said by the uh, CBO presenters, and that is that our data does demonstrate that when low-income community members can pay, they do. Um, so we should just bear that in mind. There is no, uh, you know, significant. Uh, there's no evidence that uh, people, um, even when given the opportunity during the pandemic with the moratorium in place, that when they could play, um, that they that they refused to do so. So uh, again, continue to look forward to this discussion. This is not a one-off. Um, and also, uh, I do believe that clarity is really important, that we don't want people wondering if, you know, they're going to wake up one day and see a shut-off notice in their mailbox. So um, just, um, you know, if necessary, I'm happy to bring a motion uh, to uh, instruct the department to not resume any shut-offs of low-income or lifeline um, customers. Uh, without first coming to this board, um, if that's required. Um, Marty, if that is your commitment, then I will accept that. But if that is required, I'm happy to bring that motion forward. I mean, certainly, uh, if the board wants to make that motion, that'd be fine. Uh, I do believe we have a, a very deliberate, measured plan going forward, and we would continue to bring that to the board to make sure that it meets your goals and objectives. And uh, and again, uh, we have no, uh, the, the idea is to try to do everything we can to avoid getting people in the situation where they can't pay their bill. And we do have a, a, a lot of months ahead to deliver on that before we ever get to the point of having to make that decision about a shutoff. So if that's acceptable, I'd ask us, let, let us uh, work the plan if, you, if you're comfortable with that and bring it back to make sure that we're on the path that we should be on in your eyes. Okay, well, what I'm very interested in is, I mean, I understand plans, but what's really clear and what's super important is the execution of the plan. Yes. And I, we've had plans in the past, and we have demonstrated a real challenge or a real struggle with, uh, with again, communicating with, coordinating with, and actually delivering to our lowest income residents. And so um, uh, I think we'll um, ensuring that we do that as a predicate to anything that would uh, be close to a shutoff. And that's assuming we ever reinstitute shutoffs for poor people. And I just want to say that from my perspective, it's um, that would not be the direction that I would move. I'm simply not proposing that uh, as an absolute action at this juncture because I haven't taken the time, um, we haven't as a board taken the time to get uh, additional feedback from the department around that level of policy making. So at this juncture, I'm just interested in making sure that there will be no change in the status quo um, until we've had further time to both look at what the department's doing, assess and increase our um, engagement in community and come up with a way to move forward that ensures service to everyone and also uh, you know, see how effective we can be on the legislative side um, as it relates to securing funds that are available to meet that debt burden. Um, so, and um, you're correct. No, no change in the status quo. All right. Any other comments? So I just want to thank um, everybody that came to give public comment. As um, President McLean Hill had indicated, it's not easy to make your way down here and give public comment, but I just want people to know that we hear you and we appreciate the comments. I would second that. 
and I, I, I don't know what the protocol would be to sort of request some kind of an update. Is it three months? Is it, you know, just to make sure we're, we're moving towards those targeted goals that President McLean Hill was talking about. So we're, we know every, you know, 60 days or 90 days or so is every, if, if everything is moving forward. Oh, well, this is September. We'll put a presentation back um, from the department on for December. Okay. And we'll just and, keep and an eye on it. And what we can try to do is try to create some distinct metrics to mm -hmm. measure the programs mm -hmm. um, and metrics that we know we're reaching people and, and be able to keep track of those and bring them to you as often as, mm -hmm. as possible. So some, some measuring points that we can all recognize. Y quizás, perdón, pero le quiero agradecer a todos los que eh, necesitaron traducción y a la traductora que de aquí de una centroamericana eh, aprecio mucho su traducción y que todos se desplazaron hoy y que probablemente tienen hambre también. Así que, eh, perdón que no hay almuerzo. Uh, thank you for that. Also, uh, moving forward, um, I think if we know that we're going to have significant public participation, we're going to want to think about how we have translation services so that people in real time yes. can know what we're saying in addition to translation for us at the board. But we want to make sure that we have translation services available for the audience as well. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you're going to need to do to figure that out, but we do need to figure that out. Um, okay, so we will move, I think, back into our agenda. Um, I see that we, I know a couple things. I know we have a hard out uh, by one of our commissioners at 1.45 today. Um, I'd like to uh, just ask uh, our Inspector General how long this presentation will be, um, so I can decide if that's going to go next or if we're going to go next with um, the presentation from SHIP. President McLean Hill, um, there's one thing that you learn as a as a young trial attorney when you first start out, which is don't go up in front uh, in front of any decision makers when they're hungry and tired after a long meeting. <laughs> so I'm happy to to yield this slot to the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and have my presentation shifted to to an upcoming meeting or at the 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 discretion of the board. Um, you know what, that is very gracious of you and we appreciate it. Um, your presentation will take place at our next board meeting as I do uh, believe that everyone should be present for it and I know everyone wants to be. Uh, and so we will instead move to the presentation from uh, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Okay, so um, I'll uh, introduce this as the folks from SHIP come up. So uh, as President McLean Hill noted in her remarks, uh, this month is the, uh, the, the uh, Hispanic Heritage Month and our, the theme is inclusivity for a stronger nation. Uh, our local uh, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers chapter, this chapter has sponsored several events so far and, and uh, they're gonna be hosting a webinar on October 12th. Uh, it's a virtual employee panel where employees can share their backgrounds, perspectives and personal histories. Also, uh, to, uh, beginning tomorrow, uh, our own uh, Evelyn Cortez Davis, who's Director of Water Engineering and Technical Services, is going to be beginning a, doing a podcast featuring uh, Ilya Espino de Morona, uh, who's the VP of the Panama Canal, and that'll be done mm. in Spanish. It'll be presented in the Spanish by the Society of Women Engineers Latinos Affinity Group. So today we have um, Marcelo De Paulo, Jesus Gonzalez, and Luvia Garces Lopez uh, here from SHIP. They are um, our officers from our uh, own local chapter here to present today. Thank you. Take it away. Buenas tardes todos. Good afternoon uh, and happy Hispanic Heritage Month to you all, Madam President, to our Board of Commissioners, and to everyone today. I am Marcelo De Paulo, Power Engineering Manager in Power Engineering Technical Services and Major Projects and President of your LADWP Chapter of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Um, today we're proud to be here today um, marking our second anniversary of the board's approval to launch an LADWP chapter. The board action made LADWP the first public agency in the U.S. to have an employer specific chapters in SHIP, SWE, and NSBE. We are proud here to join you today and give you an update on the progress of our chapter. But before we start, 
Hispanic Heritage Month gives us an opportunity as a nation to recognize the countless contributions of Latinas and Latinos, both in history, in present day, and into our future. The Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers was launched nearly 50 years ago, right here in LA, by a small group of engineers who wanted to advance the representation and success of Latinos in STEM careers. As SHIP members, we are proud to carry forward the legacy and the vision of the board to support and amplify the voices of the employees at LADIP. In our great city of Los Angeles, nearly 50% of the Hispanic population, uh, nearly 50% of the population is Hispanic. Representation matters. We thank the Board of Commissioners, our General Manager, Marty Adams, all our senior leadership, and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office for your vision and support of all the employee resource groups and in particular, our LADWP chapter. So today, we will begin by introducing you to our recent elected SHIP board and give you a recap of our past year. We will look at exciting activities we have planned and over the upcoming weeks. And we will close with a look ahead at what's next over the coming up year. We are pleased to report that we completed our chapter's first election in April of this year. Our 12 newly installed officers are uh, past president Ophelia Rubio, managing water utility engineer from the water system, myself, uh, vice president of operation Jesus Gonzalez, water works engineer from water system, vice president chapter development Wilfredo Bermudez Paz, civil engineer associate from the water system, treasurer Jose Mora, mechanical engineer power system, secretary Juvia Lopez Garcia, civil engineering associate water system, Communication Chair, Gosselin Forseca Palacios, Architectural Associate from the Water System. Outreach Chair, Brianna Blancarte, Civil Engineer Associate from the Water System. Election Chair, um, Jahaira Gasellum, Civil Engineering Associate from the Water System. Membership Chair, Andreas uh, Perez, Civil Engineer Associate from the Water System. Cultural Development Chair, Itzel Ortega Al Almazan, Architectural Associate from the Water System. and. Professional Development Chair, Sam Alvarado, Civil Engineer Associate, Power System. I'm happy to see 50% women, 50% <laughs> Latinas. Yes. Good job. Okay. <laughs> As we take on these leadership roles, we would like to recognize the previous SHIP Interim Board and SHIP Planning Committee for their service from our inception of our chapter in 2020 through June of 2022. From the Power System, we had Savi Valdez and Luis Jose Martinez. From Water System, we had Ophelia Rubio, Marvin Hermosillo, Fabiola Moreno, Brianna Rojas, Jesus Gonzalez, and Art Castro. Thank you, Interim Board. Currently, we have approximately 90 members, and we are focusing on expanding membership and participation. We had elections and elected our first board. And over the past year or so, we've had the following activities. We had a social activities with SHIP LA chapter, like networking nights. We've had volunteer opportunities with NG Tank, hosted by Engineering Student Council at UC Irvine. First, we did a First Tech Challenge Robotics Championship, hosted by LAUSD. We were involved with Multanoma Street Elementary School Fair, hosted by the elementary school. LADWP SHIP has had meetings to just general board meetings, general body meetings. Uh, we announced our recent elections. We recently gave a Founders Legacy Award to Miss Ophelia Rubio. We gave an award of certificate of appreciation to Ms. Rako Kerr. And recently, last month, we had our first in-person live event here at the JFP. We did a cafecito con pan dulce. So we had little cookies and coffee. We've had general board meetings. And then more importantly, more recently, we recently issued our first issue of Nexo, our chapter, our chapter newsletter. Nexo in Spanish is for Nexus or Central Link. So what we did is we are now going to be releasing a quarterly newsletter that gives updates of upcoming events, upcoming professional development, of upcoming um, activities that different members can participate and become on. And lastly, the big activity we're doing, we're in the process of getting our bylaws recognized by SHIP National so we can be a recognized PRG. Thank you, Marcelo. My name is Yuvia Lopez Garces. I'm a civil engineering associate in the water resources division, and I am this year's elected LEDWP ship secretary. 
First and foremost, I want to say thank you to President Cynthia McLean Hill and General Marty, uh, Manager Marty Adams for the remarks on the importance of Hispanic Heritage Month. We truly appreciate the board's support for our chapter and its members. Now, this Hispanic Heritage Month, we've planned five cultural, social, and professional activities for our community to help uplift and celebrate one another. With that said, we are excited to share our activities on the next few slides. For our first activity, we decided to kick off Hispanic Heritage Month with a cultural visit to the historical El Pueblo at Olvera Street. We had the opportunity to explore and support the colorful stands of local vendors. We also were able to meet some of our members and also enjoy an evening out with our colleagues while savoring delicious churros. Our second activity was about gathering with family and friends. We partnered with the Water Employees Club for a Dodgers night out, and we got to enjoy a ball game with new colleagues while celebrating our city. For our third activity, we're especially excited as our very own Director of Water Engineering and Technical Services, Evelyn Cortez Davis, will be the host of Un Cafecito con Mujeres in STEM podcast presented by the Society of Women Engineers Affinity Group, Latino Affinity Group. The podcast will be entirely in Spanish and it will be released and shared tomorrow, September 28th, and we'll delve into the achievements of an influential Latina in the engineering industry. So please look for it under the name of Diverse, a sweet podcast on Spotify, SoundCloud, and Apple Music, and that will be released tomorrow, September 28th. Can you um, send us the link to that? Absolutely. <laughs> And will they? Will there be a transcription in English? For I'm not sure about that, okay. <laughs> but we can both check. <laughs> now, for our fourth activity, we for decided to focus on professional development. In this emerging new era of virtual meetings, we want to give our members the confidence and opportunity to elevate and enhance their virtual presence with professional headshots from our very own photography team. Nice. That's great. And for our fifth and last activity, we are honored to have Vice President Cynthia Ruiz as our opening speaker for our hashtag Somos LADWP employee panel, where LADWP employees will have the opportunity to share what it means to be Hispanic in the U.S. We are especially grateful to have our senior assistant GM Anselmo Collins offer the closing remarks at this panel discussion that will be held on October 12th. And with that, that concludes our activities for Hispanic Heritage Month, and we hope to see you at our upcoming events. I'll now hand it over to Jesus Gonzalez, our Vice President of Operations. Thank you, Yuvia, and uh, good afternoon. Jesus Gonzalez, VP of Operations. And then with it being lunchtime, I'll take advantage and emphasize the fact that at all of our events, we do like to think that we serve some of the best tasty Mexican food you're going to find in L.A. <laughs> so we to attend, uh, but all kidding aside, we are very excited about the events that we have planned this year, not just with Hispanic Heritage Month, but throughout the year. Our focus as a chapter is going to be on our employees and the community. So we want to make sure that we assist all of our employees with, with professional development opportunities, with mentorship. Matter of fact, a lot of our membership is going to be attending the SHIP National Conference next month in North Carolina. So we're going to assist the department with its recruitment and outreach efforts. And lastly, we're going to be a lot more concerted with our focus in collaborating with other PRGs, specifically with SWE, with MSB, again, to support the DEI office with creating a tighter knit amongst the PRGs at the department. So the, the key reason for us to be here is to highlight again Hispanic Heritage Month. We also wanted to stop and thank this board in particular for again your support, your leadership, your vision. We are very confident that this chapter is gonna leave a lasting positive difference in our employees. So we're excited about the fact that we've been a chapter now for two years. You heard Marcella mention the fact that we have just, just under 100 members. That number is soon to grow based on the, the amount of activity at our recent events. So just wanted to stop. Thank you again. Thank you for the support. We look forward to, 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 to seeing you at some of our com upcoming events. And by all means, if the food isn't as good as I said it would be, come by and talk to me. We'll, we'll make it work. Is there, um, uh, do you get any financial, I don't recall, do you get any financial support from LADWP for the organization? Not, not so far. So far it's been based on member dues. We are working closely with the DE office 
to see if there's available funding that looks like it's going to be available to us. So I'm getting very excited about that. Yeah, uh, when we all look at Marty. <laughs> well, actually, um, I was on a, a Nesby meeting early on, and I was impressed with the number of people that were engaged and, and commit running committees. And then they did a financial report and I listened to the amount of money. So just look at employee dues. I said, okay, time out. So, so just initially right away last year, we, we set aside enough money for everyone to have some decent seed money for all the affinity groups. And we'll continue to support them that way. Cause they were living solely off of just very small dues collection, which, you know, doesn't really do justice to the, to the programs that they're putting together that are so valuable. So we are supporting them. We'll continue to do that. Okay. In particular, I heard that they were going to the convention and, and I wasn't sure if that was being, and, and they were going to be representing LADWP. So right. we, we have supported uh, a number of employees going to different conventions uh, and also, and, and they do a couple as a recruiting tool as well and, and represent the organization. So we've, we've been doing that as well since this, since these groups have formed up and, and started this, so. Glad to hear that. So I just wanna say thank you very much. I've been a supporter of SHIP for many, many years. I know a few months ago, the founder of SHIP, Rod Garcia, uh, passed away. And I think that he would have just been so proud. I mean, he does, you indicated he started in Los Angeles and went national. And, you know, as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, I think, uh, it was indicated earlier that 50% of the residents of LA are uh, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, Chicano, whatever term that you want to use. But what, what people forget is that if you look at the Hispanic buying power in the United States right now, it's at $2.5 trillion. So I think people are finally starting to pay attention to us. And I just want to say thank you for your presentation. I see we got the pink memo going on here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just am looking forward to interacting with the group and thank you for everything that you do. I, 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 I think I echo the comments um, and uh, how important it is. I, I think that working with the, you know, youth, through STEM and letting them see what kind of jobs are out there for people in, you know, uh, in community colleges, it's sometimes hard to navigate. So I urge us, and I know, I think we've worked in the past with uh, Marcela Oliva from LA Trade Tech, and if we haven't, we should, because that's what she does. She teaches architecture, engineering, and urban planning. And there's a lot of wonderful uh, young, you, young people going through the program that when they first come in, they don't know what they're going to choose, like the exact path, the, the nuance of the path. So what you, you know, clearly when you look at the group from DWP, there's so many different focus areas within the type of work you could do at DWP that I think it would be really excellent to be able to share. So whether it's quarterly visits by a group or by them coming here, how do you plan that and uh, uh, making it regular? It would be great. They can walk here almost. <laughs> uh, anything else? Um, thank you for being here. I really appreciate uh, the presentation. It was quite excellent. I'm also looking forward to, although I haven't checked my DWP, um, email address lately, but invitations. Um, I show up on webinars all the time. I don't want to miss yours. Uh, and in particular, since I'm a foodie, any place you're serving food, <laughs> make sure. <laughs> we like food. <laughs> make sure that I know about it. But no, it's it's uh, really quite extraordinary to see the work that's done by our employees in these um, various uh, employee resource groups. And I uh, also appreciate the work that DEI is doing to support them. And Marty, I think uh, uh, Nicole makes a very good point. We do want to make sure that we have an institutionalized way of making sure that our um, employees who are contributing so much of their time to strengthen the department, um, its recruitment, and the community at large are assisted um, as much as, uh, as they can be. So thank you all very much for being here today. Appreciate you. Uh, Ms. Cortez Davis. <laughs>
just a sidebar over there, notes. Ming. We're not done. <laughs> <It's better. laughs> Well, Commissioner, if you don't mind, um, I was asked to add a little something to what was uh, presented by the ship leadership. Um, and it was to let you know that um, we're proud to announce that the Ship LA Professional Chapter Hispanic Heritage Month celebration will feature one of our own uh, members here, which is our ship past president, Ophelia Rubio, who I believe is back in the room over here. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to be a panelist. She's going to be a panelist along with Public Works Commissioner Teresa Villegas, and also Aura Garcia, who's the LSN director. Uh, sorry, Aura Garcia and the LSN director, Barbara Romero. So this is gonna be an in-person event, and it's gonna be held this Thursday, uh, September 29th, at the Avila Adobe on Overa Street. Well, thank you very much for that, and sure. thank you for both being outstanding and representing DWP on that particular panel. So appreciate you very much. Uh, thank you all, and we will move to the next item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to need a vote for the um, approval of the minutes, and I know I'm jumping all over. So but, uh, second. <laughs> Commissioner Lair? Minutes. Yes. Minutes. Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz. Aye. Four ayes motion adopted. Uh, we also have a, um, and I again, I do know that I've got to jump back to rate pair advocate and uh, neighborhood council, but I'd like to proceed first to item M2, which Commissioner um, Ruiz called special. You indicated that you didn't. Right. So yeah, I don't need a presentation. I just wanted to make a comment on this one because as I was reviewing my board packet, I'm in full agreement. This is for uh, translation services to extend this contract. But the reason I questioned it because I looked at the languages that were being translated and out of the top six languages, it did not include Spanish. However, I was, it, I got a clarification. The reason it didn't include Spanish in this translation is because we do that in-house and that the translation is done in-house with our employees which makes me happy, so I got my answer to my question, so I'm good, and I move approval. Okay, uh, I second. Uh, would you please call the vote? Commissioner Lehrer? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Four ayes motion adopted. Okay, then we'll go back to our uh, to where we left off in the uh, agenda. There's no introduction of motions of which I'm aware. Do we have comments from the rate pair advocate? Our comments are on items M3 and M4, which were deferred. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> that worked out really well. Uh, then do we have any neighborhood impact reports? No community impact statements were filed by any neighborhood councils on any of the agenda items today, ma'am. Okay, so if I haven't completely confused myself, <laughs> <laughs> that means that we are now ready to move into closed session. Is that correct? Of my calculations, what? yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? Is there, I, maybe I'm, maybe I'm okay one. I think there was one that was this one. No, no, okay. Okay, terrific. Um, and Julie, are there any special words that you need to utter before we adjourn into closed session? Yes. The board shall recess into closed session for a conference with legal, conf with legal counsel regarding the items listed on the last page of the agenda. The board shall publicly report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention of every member present thereon in accordance with section 54957.1 of the California Government Code. Terrific, and we're gonna keep this room for closed session so everyone else can leave. We'll also uh, take a... Uh, Five-minute break. Yeah, I was going to say, we could take five or we could take 15. It's up to the board members who are remaining. 
Well, somebody has to leave. I, I, I need to go. I need to go. Okay. I, I'm going to go at two. Or it's, I, it's and you're leaving at two? <laughs> so then five. Oh, then we're taking a five-minute break. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. No, not a problem. Changing my flight. I'm sure there is. Yeah. We can take a little snack. Yeah. Did you get the attachment? Well, I'm changing my flight. <laughs> 